What up, what up? Welcome, Salty Dogs Podcast Season 2, or 3, oh, Season 3. Good morning to the Louise. ICT. That's right. It episode is early. Two. It is 2 a.m. <laughs> in, in somebody's Summer, time. It's somewhere, somewhere, it's somewhere it's 2 a.m. Yeah. We are, uh, we're Sans, Sans Casey this morning. He, we uh, miss him very much. He, he needs a calendar. And I didn't um, brush my teeth in the books. Can I, can I say all of the Casey things? Yep. Doth, cast to thy pods, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's pet Leviathan. Yep. I that, think that, that, that's those are, about it. Those, are, that all, those are all of the things that he says. Uh, so we've got Nick Eady actually taking the place. This is our Casey. Meet Casey. Good morning. Good Do not morning. adjust your screens. I am this good looking. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, don't adjust your brightness. He is that white. Dude, the only time I get better looking is in the dark. <laughs> Oh, you're funny. <laughs> did you did you cue all those up? You're like, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna make jokes this morning. Jason, you know me better than that. I gotta hold this on. Give on us your down. best dad joke. My best dad joke. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know why a duck has feathers? Why is that? So you can't see his butt quack. <laughs> <laughs> that is that wow. is a good one. Wow. <laughs> they'd make you good, did it. They'd make good plumbers. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> you would get no plumber just, crack just with t- a duck. <laughs> tell him to put it on the bill. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you are dadding hard. You're quacking me. You up asked for it, man. You oh asked God, for it. you did. You did the. You did this. <laughs> this is my fault. I you apologize. are the. You're the culprit, bro. That's okay. It was worth it. it was awesome. Worth it. Awesome. Well, we're excited to be here this morning. We've got a a stellar crew. Jeff Jewett, Pastor Jeff Jewett. We know and love the man, and uh, he uh, he was a little um, adverse towards going live uh, the last time we were with him <laughs> a little bit he yeah, said what yeah. was that that quote you said you were like you you sound like elmo you just didn't want people to know you actually look like him. <laughs> right <laughs> we don't think you look like elmo yeah you're a good looking dude and a, and a very very smart and wise man so we're excited to have you here tackling this topic of the myth of full-time ministry we're gonna break some of that open um, we actually had somebody suggest this topic um, by filling out our survey and so they may have gotten that through their email, and so you can sign up for our email list, and we send things out periodically. Or they might have found it at our website, saltydogspodcast.com, and there's actually a uh, button in the menu that you can click called Take Our Survey. And so we just ask a couple questions, and um, this is where you can let us know the topics that you want tackled. So topic today actually comes from one of our listeners, and so they were interested in vocation, calling, and uh, ministry for the non-pastor, non-missionary person. So we're going to dive into some good of topic. that. It is a good topic. Um, and interestingly, in season one, yep, uh, Nick Eady was here and with Chris, with Chris, and we did an episode called "Identity in Christ versus Identity in Ministry." Mm. And so you might want to go back and listen to that one if you haven't already. Season one, uh, check that one out. Man, things have changed a lot since then. <laughs> yeah, here we are. We're actually live people. Hey, no. Chris and I are, are um, we're related. I'm his uncle and he's my nephew. Everybody likes to say your brother, your cousin, cousin yeah. your other Mexican but I'm just, friend. But I can see ourselves here on... I've uh, got one too. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can see us here and I just am like, okay, yeah, like we're, we're, we're going bald, bro. Mm-hmm. And not going, am. We d- yeah, I mean... I'm only 28. I, I like and to it's still. Gone. I'm still holding on to it, so I like to say I'm going bald. But no, I'm, I've embraced it. Yeah. So we have to do this because it's our one of my favorite we segments. We need a little so salt. So you get to do it. We need a little salt shaker. Yeah. There might be a few in the kitchen. Yeah, but we're not going to stop the feed to go get them. So poor planning. Our I know right. Our pass the salt segment today comes from Stephen. On Facebook, and here's what Thank he says you, to us. Thanks, Stephen. And and so Nick, you need to assume your role because there's a certain something that Casey does during our past assault, and so I'm just going to hand that over to you. But uh, Stephen says, "I drove over five thousand. You don't even know what it is, do you? Mm, no. Uh, well, you already have them. You just need to wish them upon somebody. Oh, okay. I got uh, okay. It. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen says, "I drove over five thousand miles this summer, and I listened to all of your podcasts." That is awesome. Wow. Thank you for the work the Lord is doing in your life. 2018 was a season of unbelief for me, but the Holy Spirit finally convicted me. Uh, sometime down the road, I'd love to be able to be on a podcast with you guys because my testimony involves drugs also. 
um, now. <laughs> so he just makes the request, like, I want to be on the podcast. But then he says, now, please read this on your next podcast and wish me the rosy cheeks. May the Lord <laughs> bless you and keep you always, my brothers in Christ, with love, Stephen. And That's so, so Nick, nice, Stephen. I, I wish you the rosiest of rosy cheeks, brother. Ever. <laughs> That the Lord has ever doth the pawn doth others. Doth the pawn. Yep, yep. Awesome. Cast those rosy cheeks. Cast Steven, those. That's a that's a huge feat. To listen to all of those. That is a huge feat. Yeah, we've had a couple of people who have said like, "Keep it up, man." We're I'm already through all the episodes. I mean, so see, two seasons was thirty six episodes. It's not really that much to listen to. I've probably consumed hundreds of episodes of podcast, and Nick probably triple that. Well, I do sit in a truck for 12 hours a day, so... And you drive 5,000 miles a summer. Oh, uh, you know. Something like that. Uh, around there. Yep. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. All let's right. do it. Who's going to crack this thing open? So, the first part of our title is The Myth of Ministry. Mm-hmm. And so... Maybe it might give be good to give maybe some experience uh, that we have all had in ministry or currently have right now. Mm-hmm. And Jason, I don't know if you just want to cue those and... And kind of just go around the table. Yeah, well, let's just go left to right. So we'll start with my left. Nick, we'll start with you, man. Tell us about maybe some of your past ministry experience. All right. So uh, back in 2012, well, in high school, I felt the calling to go into ministry, uh, whatever that meant. But um, I was working at Waste Management Hall and Trash, and it was 2015. I felt a strong call to leave my job and then go into full-time ministry, uh, working for a church. And so I did that. Um, I was funded through NAM and through an internship and all that. And um, circumstances have led me back to the secular world of work. I love how you put that in air quotes because, yeah. 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 It's good. good. All right, Chris, go for it. Yeah, so I volunteered in several student ministries in Houston, uh, moved up here to take a, I mean, I guess not take a position, but to what I believed at the time to be answering a call, and I guess I would even still say I agree with that, uh, to move up here and to be a youth pastor, did that for almost, I think it was three and a half, three years, somewhere in that time frame, ended up stepping away from that, uh, took a short hiatus, a way to just kind of focus on myself and family. Um, and then in 2017, uh, some crazy, crazy guy uh, roped me back into ministry, and it, it was, it's been great. So I'm still currently serving. We've transitioned quite a bit as far as our model. Um, we are, we're doing more of a house church, missional community type model right now, and, uh, but I'm still considered a, a pastor and, and fully functioning in ministry. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Awesome. Well, let me um, let me figure out how to tell my story as quick as I possibly can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So when I was younger, oh, actually, I didn't feel a call uh, into ministry probably until I was about twenty four or twenty five. I was actually riding in the car with this guy, and I'm like weeping because it I'm was look- beautiful. It, Is that when you did this to me? Do I, no. Oh, okay. It, that, that was, was a different time. time. Yeah. Okay. That was earlier in the show. <laughs> No, it was, yeah, it was a beautiful weep. I I was, like, scared to death mm-hmm. because I knew the Lord. I mean, it was like, I just felt this huge impression, like, I feel like God is calling me to speak to people mm-hmm. about him from stage. You know, like, be a preacher, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I just wept because it was like this unworthiness kind of situation going on. Like, I'm not worthy. Who am I? I'm a piece of crap. Like... You know, that's how I felt about myself. And so i um, 25. I really felt the call, but I grew up in church and um, always felt like attaining the pulpit was like, oh, if I can get there, you know, my life will be great and I'll, ha- I'll have it all together. So I felt that call when I was 25 ish, 24, 25, and actually answered that call um, by moving from Houston to Wichita to help start a campus of an existing church. So I came on as a campus pastor slash church planter and entered into that world. And that is a world of its own, let me just tell you. And so functioned in that for about four years. Um, we closed that location, and then um, we started the Source Wichita. And so I kind of took the pastor-teacher role. And since then, as you, many of you may have heard me say, I've kind of shed 
some of those those titles in essence, mm-hmm. but I still say that uh, I teach and I lead by the grace of God, and so I do that in the, in the context at the source uh, here in Wichita, Kansas, and so that's where I currently am teaching and preaching and equipping and hopefully being a resource to the body. Good. Amen. Yep. Jeff. Of course, we're going to be using, I'm going to be using phrases and terms <clears throat> that we're going to break open a little bit later. So it's, it's intentional. Um, but I remember um, an experience, I guess, of the, in Nick Eady's air quotes, the call. <laughs> um, when I was about 13, uh, the problem was, is I was <coughs> a, um, a very, a very rebellious kid all the way up until uh, Rebel Christ without got, a cause, huh? Yeah, Just I don't, I don't know. I had cut. a cause, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but and and sometimes the cause was just because. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but um, but I remember that that I I remember a a moment. I remember an experience. Um, but I I was actively rebellious. I mean, from the age of three, I I remember consciously ignoring the voice of God. Um, and really, he didn't get a hold of me. Um, and I didn't get a hold of him until I was almost 20. But knowing that was there, I wasn't running from a call, but the reality is is that um, what we would call my salvation went hand in hand with the calling, that there was no right. way for me to be something other than what he had called me to be when I was far away from him. Um, I know we, we often say in the church, you know, God only speaks to those that dwell in him and he and them and all of this stuff. That's not true. God speaks, right. period. Do people say that? I do. I hear that, yep. you know, and, and they'll proof text a psalm. Um, to <laughs> oh, one. One. Gotcha. There, yeah. there is one. Um, and, they'll, and they'll use that and say, well, God doesn't speak to you unless you pray the prayer. Um, that's not true. That's just not true. Um, he spoke... I'm going to call baloney on that one. <clears throat> yes, baloney. please. Cue Old Testament and everyone that God ever spoke to pre. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Which is everyone. Yeah. Um, and so, so for me, um, coming to faith also meant accepting a call. Um, the path to that, um, I, I'm kind of odd around the table in that I am um, uh, associated with a denomination and credentialed and titled and all of those things we're going to be talking about. Um, but the path from, from that was a long path. I did not begin pastoring um, the way we think of pastoring until I was 30. And so I've only been at this about 12 or 13 years. Um, so it took me a while. It took me a while. Um, but but here, I, here I am. And the reality is, is um, however you parse being saved, I cannot be saved and not do what I'm doing. Um, it's just, it's part of who I am. We talk about calling. Um, and that is, it's who I am. And it is, what I am doing is vocationally part of, of who I am in Christ. And the two, they just can't be separate. So Right. So <clears throat> now that we have the, back, the backgrounds, um, let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the myths of full-time mm-hmm. ministry because I think maybe the, the thing behind... The question, you know, or can you talk about vocation and calling for the non-pastor, non-missionary? Mm-hmm. And so I think when they, they say that the non thing, um, they're assuming that you have to have these titles or these roles or whatever it is um, in order to, like, mm-hmm. you know, you, I don't have this I don't have this title. I'm not credentialed. I've not been affirmed or whatever. I'm not part of some organization that has sent me or uh called me as a pastor, whatever it is, like, you know, how am I supposed to navigate um, this life? And so there's this myth that, well, that you have to have those things Mm -hmm. or that you don't have, or or, or, I don't know. I just feel like maybe there's some misconceptions behind that. So like, what do we think some of those are? Let's bring some of those out. Well, what what Nick said at the beginning, (coughs) um, we'll call Nick out. um, (laughs) And he did put it in air quotes, but the difference between sacred and secular is a myth. Yep. Hmm. There, yeah. there is no distinction between the sacred and the secular. Um, in in creation, God did not 
did not separate. Well, this is sacred and this is secular. He said it is it is good. Yeah. It is all good. Yeah. And so I think that's a good starting point because what? there is no difference. So so why do we divide it? Like, what do you think? Why why do we do that? I, I mean, I think a part of it is, and you'll have to excuse my voice if you hear it. I've been coughing like crazy all week long, so <clears throat> so I may sound a little off, but. Um, I think a part of it too is is when if you can separate something like that, you can separate expectations, responsibility, um, requirements of you. And I think for so many people, if they can separate it, they can put themselves in that other category. Mm-hmm. When in all actuality, there is no other when you are in Christ. I mean, it, it, we we are all the same. We're on all the same playing field. I would agree with that. I think that, uh, like, so when I was in the Marine Corps, one of the things that they always told us was, first and foremost, you are a rifleman. So no matter what your job was, that that was first and foremost your job was to be a rifleman. But then, so you, in other branches, they tend to separate this out, like, oh, that's not my job. That you know, Mm -hmm. that's the grunt's job or whatever. And so it does alleviate you from handling some of that responsibility. But first and foremost, as a Christian, we are disciplers. And when we go out into the world, we are supposed to be discipling people. So let me ask a question that is intentionally a trap. Um, Uh Uh-oh. There's something in the Proverbs about people (coughs) setting uh, snares and lying in wait for (laughs) for ruin. Yeah, I'm I'm a New Covenant Christian. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm I'm just proof texting Proverbs (laughs) on you. Um, Well, and, and, and... Proof texting is all in the eye of the beholder, right? If I don't agree with what you're saying, I'm going to say you're proof texting. So, um, <laughs> it's like calling someone a bigot. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, but here's the question: Is what was Jesus's ministry? Here's why I ask this: Because you none know, of us want to fall into that trap. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I see that. Yeah. I see Rhetorical. that. Rhetorical. But um, but if you if you think about that, where where we will automatically go to is we will talk about um, his healing, his discipling, mm-hmm. his moving throughout Galilee, um, of course, uh, the cruciform nature of what he did, um, bearing the cross, um, uh, death, burial, resurrection. We instantly go to those things that occurred in three years of a 33-year ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, my question, um, and, and the trap, is what was Jesus' ministry? Well, if three years was the entirety of his ministry, then was Jesus not ministering when he was working in a carpenter shop? Um, see, there was 30 years of Jesus' life where essentially, if we were to put it into modern vernacular, he was punching a clock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he got up every morning. He dealt with customers. He dealt with um, blue labor work, um, He uh, blue-collar labor. Huh. Yeah. Um, it- Blue robe. Blue robe. There we go. (laughs) No, wait, that was Mary. That was Mary. So um, that's a whole different conversation. Um, But, uh, (laughs) but, uh, but man, he, uh, we missed the 30 years of his life. And I've pointed this out to some of my folks here recently because it's been important for me. Even in the creed that we affirm, uh, we will say things like, um, he was born of the Virgin Mary. And then we go, and he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Like, there is this huge gap between the infant Christ and the crucified Christ. Mm. And the reason I bring this up is because Jesus' ministry was not just. It did not begin when he was baptized by John. It did not begin in the wilderness. It began in the manger. It was incarnational. And his entire life was ministry. And most of his life was not lived in what we would call... Active ministry. Yeah. Right. Well, let let's take a step back because I'm a I'm big on definitions. I love, mm-hmm. I love. Let's define that term because, you know, it's it's also interesting that we um, we say ministry, mm. and it really does feel like this religious term, um, and then we qual or we, what's the word, um, not qualify it. Um, we add a descriptor to it, mm-hmm. so. Okay, yeah, we use yeah, this no, that's word. Super interesting. We yeah. use this word, ministry, and then we say full time ministry, right? So, it we've automatically attached vocation or paycheck to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's just go back to maybe the the basics of what ministry is. What does the term mean? Do you guys know what it means? 
Is that a trick Webster question? defines mi- no. no it's kidding. a real question. Oh, okay. Like, do you know? Do you know the definition of ministry? I feel like every I mean, question is a trap now. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Paranoid. So, so ministry in in my my understanding <clears throat> actually means like service. Mm-hmm. It's a service. Mm-hmm. As it so like as a servant, and so if you um, contextualize that in that time, really the servants weren't the ones that were deemed as like the greatest, right? So Jesus says, you want to be the greatest in my kingdom, that he who is the least will be the greatest, right? Mm-hmm. He, The one who's low, who humbles himself and, and serves and gives, um, he's the one that's going to be lifted up in the kingdom. So then Jesus took the form of a servant, right? He left his heavenly dwelling, came, took the body of man, humbled himself, and then came and served. And in the in his ministry, in the way that he served, it, right, his service was to come and give a full image of who God was, and the love that the Father has for us, the mercy, the grace, the power, the authority, the sovereignty, the um, the will, right. He came to manifest all that and to communicate that. Essentially, um, the Israelites and you know the the watching world had a an understanding of who God was. And then Jesus says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to correct all of that. Right. <laughs> I'm going to give you a proper understanding of who God is. And so, he, again, he took the, he served. He, he got low and he um, got to a place to where he could lift people up. And so um, just isn't that service. Op- isn't that opposite, though, of what we're saying, what we tend to think ministry is? Because I would say so. We, well, yeah, we give it title and position. Yeah, and there's, and there's a position of power that comes with that title. Right. There's a position of esteem, of respect. I mean, it, throwing that, that phrase around, I mean, mm-hmm. I remember when I used to walk up to people, the pride that would well up in me when I would say, and this very well could be a Chris Cerna thing, but hi, I'm Chris Cerna. I'm a youth pastor at XYZ. Mm-hmm. And, and the... That's a horrible name for a church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, XYZ Church. I guarantee you there's a church that's probably XYZ Church. Xylophone, yak, zebra church. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember when that would happen, and, and I feel like there's a, there's a pull. Now, you don't have to give in to that pull, but there is definitely this pull towards pride and mm-hmm. towards I'm here and other people are here. And it, it's not intentional, but it, it just kind of comes with the territory when you get titles right. involved. And it's, it's, it's not just how you feel about it. It is a perception that is broader than just your personal view of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I always, I, I sometimes very sarcastically, sardonically make the comment when someone's in the hospital or they're sick, they need the preacher to come and pray for them. Like their prayers aren't the same. Um, and I, I say sometimes my ministry is being the lucky rabbit's foot. Like if, mm-hmm. we, just, if we just bring this, this token preacher on board, then God will all of a sudden hear us. Um, and that's definitely one of those misconceptions yeah. that, that we've right. talked about, is that people, for whatever reason, think that, that pastors, preachers, teach, I mean, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. that it's like they have this magic red telephone to God, right. and that their prayers are, are better received are, are, I don't know, more infused with the mm. blessing of God, but that is absolutely a myth. It is a myth. Right. And, and uh, with that myth, um, I, I do feel like <clears throat> I need to say, as a pastor, it is a profound blessing to be invited into absolutely. those moments. Um, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging the bedside yeah. or the hospital room. I, I love that. I love being called and asked to participate in the tough parts as well as the amazing parts of people's I mean, lives. W- would you say that in, in those moments, those are some of the purest moments of mm-hmm. ministry right. that, that do happen? It's true ministry. Yes. Again, it's, it's service, mm-hmm. right? You are, right. You, you're giving your time. You're giving yourself. What is it? Um, was it Peter who said, as a fellow servant or as a fellow shepherd of God's people, um, shepherd over your flock willingly, right? Not because you're compelled to, or may have uh, been Paul wait, speaking was to Timothy. Paul t- speaking to Timothy. Yeah. So he's saying, like, just as a fellow servant, shepherd over the flock, give yourself to them, um, not because you like have to, but because you desire to mm-hmm. serve them. And I think he was correcting some stuff there. And I think, uh, again, with ministry, let me let me kind of back up and and try and make the point I was trying to make earlier. Mm-hmm. Jesus. He came and he gave a full, he was the fullness of the Godhead, 
in bodily form. And so he was the Logos, the Word, made manifest so that people could see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he, he humbled himself. He came so that he could give people a proper view of the Father and his love, his mercy, and his grace because the ancient world had a certain perception. So he came to, in essence, correct that and then obviously be the atonement, the sacrifice, um, and then would bridge that gap and bring salvation. So, um, in essence, the same way that we're to serve is to give our life, give ourself as a way that however we possibly can, however I might serve you, whatever that means, it, it, selflessness, humility, giving, mm. pray, whatever it might be, I'm getting self out of the way. Again, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow me. So I can give myself to people in such a way that then I can help them have that proper view of the Father. Mm -hmm. Because as I'm humbling myself and loving and serving, I'm living as Jesus did, and I'm only doing it by his Spirit in me. And so I'm continuing his service to the world to love and give and help so that people have a proper view of who, the, who God is. Yeah. Yes. And, and right. I agree. And I think that that's all beautiful. And I think that that sounds right. And, <laughs> but, but is that the default? Is that what happens by default in, uh, I'm going to use the word system in, in the system that is the church today in America is, is that the default? Not if that's not what they're being taught without intentionality. Right. And without, you know, exactly somebody coming alongside you and teaching you that this is the way that that happens. Because for so many people, I mean, the myth of ministry for me was that is what happened. Mm -hmm. When in what I experienced was, no, there's this machine and it has to be fed every single week that is the Sunday service. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm not, not I, there, the Sunday service is not full of evil and it's not this bad thing, but it absolutely can become an idol in a sense mm -hmm. to where it gets the most attention there is it gets the most priority placed on it because the people are going to show up and the donuts have to be ready and the coffee has to be brewed and the kids ministry has to be manned and 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 so goes God's people that are sitting on the sidelines not being tended to or or having these things that have to happen that begin to have I mean they're the priority not the people and and you recognize it even as you're saying that the fallacy of creating a system like that um, where even with intention, good intention, we want to serve ministerially. Correct. Yes, yes. What we end up doing is we create we we end up creating a culture of consumerism, um, of entertainment, of me showing up not to be served or to serve, but but instead to consume. And it's unintentional. It right. Is it is absolutely. It is one hundred percent unintentional. Grant Jones, he's actually really getting getting involved, saying some things here on on Facebook. But he says, "Don't forget the donuts. It's that <laughs> that service machine." Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. It and and yeah, it's like we typically. So here's another myth that we can expose. Typically, when we think of full time ministry. We only think of a handful of opportunities to be in full-time ministry within the body. How many mm -hmm. positions do you have in your in your church? You see, isn't that funny? Um, the yep. the current model for doing air quotes doing yeah, church right. um, is that if you show up, then what we're going to do is we're going to give you a position. Um, you don't volunteer in a church anymore. You get a position. You're on staff. Yeah. Go to church websites. Everyone's on staff. Um, and, and this model is creating, it, it's a bifurcation. It's creating a divide uh, in, in the way that we think because there is no sense of, even on the base level, there is no sense of me going to work as ministry. Even the way we're talking about ministry and vocation, we're talking about serving other people. How about serving an employer? How about serving uh, the integrity of our family by being faithful for 30 years in a vocation? Um, that is, that's ministry. Mm. Um, we spend so much of our working lives working towards not having to work. Yeah. 
and ministry is the is turning that around where the work is the ministry regardless of what you're doing whether you're a carpenter in Galilee. It's a good way to view it. You know, it it just doesn't your, matter. Your work is your ministry. Right. So what I was going to say is you typically have lead pastor, maybe maybe right. uh, associate. associate pastor, youth pastor, worship, worship pastor, pastor, kids, kids pastor. Maybe group pastor. Isn't that great that we have to hire a pastor to teach us how to worship? <laughs> Brilliant. I thought hey, that was Chris Tomlin. I thought he was designated as the the whole the, the worship pastor for all Christians. Didn't he just respond online? I think he did. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Thanks yeah, for yeah, watching. Yeah, yeah, appreciate today. you. Yeah. How great is our God? He's great. He's pretty good. <laughs> You're, he's, not, he's not a wow. heretic. Wow. He's not a heretic. Hey, we I'm don't wolf, do that. No. Wolf, we, need, no. we need a button. Well, that we everybody hit. is. Because no, no, but it's like... The heretic button yeah. or the wolf, right, wolf right. in sheep's clothing button. Yeah, we're, we're he's me- not. He's not either of those things. <laughs> any of those we're, things. We're Everybody turning. is a heretic. A heretic is simply just not believing what I believe. So Ooh, there that's we go. right. There just, we go. Yeah, they're all Dropping bigots. And they're all, you're welcome. Big, bigots wow. and heretics. Oh gosh. Wow. Oh Lord. <laughs> what were we saying? Okay. So what I was saying was you were listing off all the positions. Yeah. Right, so we're right. thinking that we're thinking that. Um, we have to have this role in order to be in full time. And and look, let me let me just say this. I don't think it is wrong to aspire towards that. Like if you feel called to pastor youth and there's an opportunity for you to be paid vocationally right. to right. do that, absolutely do that. I think what we're trying to delineate in this podcast is that you don't have to have that title or you don't have to have that role that the Lord individually calls people just like you said you couldn't separate um your salvation from your service Mm -hmm. you just can't because if we we know christ and let me just say this like we're uh, i've said this before we're all in our in our journey um i think i said process in the past and i was corrected so we're all in our (laughs) journey of knowing christ and i cannot hold you to the standard of my journey nor can you desire to attain where I'm at in my journey. You have to be in your journey in your place and you have to be in your journey in your place and allow the Lord to lead you. And so you may be in a season, a time where you're just getting to know the Lord Mm -hmm. and maybe you haven't felt that call. Well, I don't feel a call. Well, continue to seek the Lord just because you're not doing something that is considered ministry. Doesn't mean that you're not in an intimate growing relationship with Jesus. Your yeah. your uh, your destiny essentially is that those he foreknew he predestined to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. So ultimately, your destiny is that you're conformed into the image of Christ. Your destiny is not that you have had a um, successful ministry on earth. Although, right. as you're conformed into his likeness, that will be the byproduct <laughs> because you will be more like Christ. You will be more loving. You'll be more kind. You will care about people in a way that you want to serve them. And that will naturally flow out of you. And so I think there's a there's an incubation time mm-hmm. where you're yeah. in Christ and then you break out because you can't stay there anymore. Again, even Jesus. I mean, if we're following Christ, even Jesus, it says, uh, grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with with God and man. Okay, I get this. As 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 incarnate God, that he grew in wisdom and stature with humanity but with God this is Jesus hmm. yeah. he he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God man he grew in that you know the orthodox have this um, if you if you ask a greek orthodox if they are saved they will the astute ones will often say i hope not um, because the the rationale is, if I'm saved, then this is it. I've arrived, and this yeah. kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, the idea is, you are being saved. You are always it is a process. Yeah, yeah. this a journey. Um, journey. You journey. are. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you are Do, always. Don't slap my wrist. I'm sorry. <laughs> but even, but even Jesus was on that, on that journey. Yeah. Um, where he was growing. And, and to say that ministry begins when, when you're getting a paycheck, when you're on staff, um, what a slap in the face to the incarnation. Well, the interesting Ooh. thing is, going back to kind of what Jason was talking about, is being called to that vocation of ministry, part of the way that we discuss it and we talk about it is the problem, right? Mm. So another language, podcast, language yeah, plays so a another podcast that I listened to says, you are absolutely 100% in full-time you can, ministry. You can it name, only depends on how God decides to pay you. 
Mm. <laughs> and so good. It, it like yeah. that, that is say that one more time, and you can actually name drop this podcast if you want. Oh yeah, uh, it's one two three life school podcast. Love that podcast. Caesar Kalinowski. Yep. You definitely or is Caesar. On if you're listening, or as Jeff likes to call him, Kalinoscopy. <laughs> 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 he. Uh, but Every time I listen to him, that's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> hey oh Yeah. Yeah, he says, you know, you are 100% in full-time ministry. Every every person out there is full-time ministry. It just depends on how God decides to pay you. That's good. Yeah, just going back to what we said earlier, um, and I think uh, Jeff said it, and Sharon actually requoted it. She said, yes, work is your ministry, and we have to get into that mindset. Again, it's all about breaking mindsets, breaking mentalities, exposing the myths, and then and putting some truth on that. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I have a question. I know, Jeff, you got some stuff that we want to get into, and we want to start looking at Scripture and stuff, but the question that I want to ask is... the Bible? Is, yeah, you know, I hear that there's some, there's some good stuff in there. <laughs> um, but the question that I want to ask is, is would, would there be more clarity that is brought to this topic if... Ministry, when people use it, it's such a broad term, and it could mean one of 20 different things depending on your context. Would it be better for people to stop using the phrase ministry and start being more descriptive? And if maybe ministry was the phrase that was used for all believers, I mean all believers everywhere, mm. and it, I mean this is more so of what God has called us and told us, you know, His ministry for all believers and that we got more specific with vocational, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to use the word ministry to describe <laughs> it, but vocational ministry, like, hey, maybe you don't say, oh, I'm in ministry, but, oh, I, I help equip parents and lead children to a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. This is, and, and it's more specific as opposed to ministry. Well, essentially, they are equippers because Scripture tells us that they are given certain roles to equip the people for the work of ministry. Mm-hmm. So we are supposed to be using that terminology rather than they're in ministry and I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And wouldn't the world be bad, a, a really bad place, um, if ministry was only what you did inside of a church building? Yuck. I mean, you think about Nick's uh, sanitation engineer. <laughs> um, That's a nice in, title. Industrial athlete. There you go. <laughs> um, but man, that is it, for us. We put our cans out Thursday or Wednesday night. Mm. Thursday morning, I lay awake. It's it's the greatest time of the week for me. It's like a fresh start when I hear my trash cans being dumped every every nice. week. It's like I go out and every all of the trash of my life has magically disappeared. Mm. Um, and I think I think, man, what a what a lousy place things would be if we didn't have that. Yeah. Um, uh, or, or, or all of the, the components. You know, I stopped at um, uh, Chick-fil-A. Is, is, that, uh, is that sponsorship? Um, it is now. Chick- they were. Chick-fil-A, <laughs> if you want to pay us for that mention, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Although the gal that served me, ministered to me, was way too chipper for 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, but, she, um, she, you, but she's paid, so she's paid vocation. There we go. Yeah, right. I'm sure um, it was her pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> she's, serving, she's serving you, but that's how God chose to pay her yeah. is through his, his chicken company. That's, that's right. That's right. His, his chicken, chicken, chicken company. company. Um, but, but man, um, wouldn't, wouldn't life be a lot more miserable if we didn't have these people who were, ser- who were serving each other, whether it's in industry, um, at a quick trip, at a Chick-fil-A, um, driving a trash truck, whatever it is. If if we didn't have, these are all components of ministry of service, yeah. and if we didn't have that, yeah. and to say that ministry is only when you are doing something in and for the church, um, the way that we understand church is almost a perversion. Not almost; it is a perversion of what God intended for us, um, it, because all of it has to run. Yeah. Hmm. So so can we maybe just go back to boiling down that whole definition, that understanding of like full-time full-time mm-hmm. ministry like essentially you're saying full-time service mm-hmm. well you everybody is on the clock essentially with the lord because the spirit is always dwelling within us like i think that's something we have to maybe even just hold on to it's like we are in him and he's in us always no matter what he's not some force that we call down to like now, who, shoot who out is and, we when you those say in we. christ okay yeah those in christ oh i thought he was french <laughs> we <laughs> Oh gosh! I just don't want anybody to miss the distinction because it's so easy right. for people who 
are not in full-time paid ministry to go, oh, well, that's them and not me. Yeah, well, and, we all and have... And the, the statement that it, we're making today is that it's if you it, are in Christ, yeah, it is all of us. And Christ mm-hmm. is in us. We have his spirit, which he said. So again, going back to this, Jesus came, he served. And then he said, look, I'm going to go away, and then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, and it's better that I go away. Mm-hmm. Because then I wouldn't send the helper, but I'm going to send him, and he's going to do all these things. You're going to do everything I did, and you're going to do greater. greater. So basically, yeah. he's saying, look, I came to serve. You're going to serve, and you're actually going to serve in greater capacity because mm-hmm. the spirit that was in me or with me is now going to be given to you. And so he was passing the baton to all of us who were in him, um, yeah, right, whom he would call. So by salvation, then we receive the spirit. So we have that, that, that power in mm-hmm. us. Again, when I say power, like we think miracles, healing, raising the dead, that kind of stuff, but we have the power to be selfless. Right. We have the power to sync with the heart and the mind of God and then live out his will on earth, which may just be, I need to help give you a right, I need to help give you a right understanding of who the Father is in this area of your life. So if you want to go back to mm-hmm. one, two, three, Life School, Life School podcast, mm-hmm. it, look, what they say <clears throat> often is, um, discipleship, right, is simply um, taking people from one belief an area of unbelief to belief mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in every area of their life. And yep. so when people are struggling in situations, it's because maybe they're not believing or thinking properly about the Father and who He is and the impact it has on their life. And so if you're, like, struggling with your, your circumstance, well, then I'm here and I might be able to give to help you alter your circumstance, but ultimately my service to you is to help infuse truth into that area of unbelief. Right. And that's what Christ did to everyone, yeah. right? And so I think... And, and becoming a professional minister, paid vocational church staff minister in that capacity um, to, uh, to fix your spiritual condition is like a psychologist becoming a shrink because they're jacked up emotionally. Hmm. Um, you know, it just, uh, let me tell you, if, if you're waiting to be a minister until you get into, um, a, uh, a paid staff, a paid position, you're sunk. You are sunk because you, 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 it, you can't be faithful. You can't wait to be faithful to that call until you're in a position. If you're not faithful first in the small things, um, then you won't be faithful in everything that follows. Yeah, absolutely. And they I should think put that in a book somewhere. <laughs> another another myth of ministry is is that you, whenever you do achieve that, you know, okay, I, this is official. Mm-hmm. I have this title. I'm doing this thing. Is that you will continue to remain faithful to God? Right. That you will that you will then start focusing on people, pastoring, and whatever whatever area you are then serving in. But it gets 100 percent harder to do that when there is a paycheck involved. And let me tell you, the burden that comes when that, I mean, the the psychological and mental bombardment that happens on your mind when you step into that ring of, of vocational ministry, it, I mean, it's an all-out assault because mm-hmm. your time is to then be 100% focused on God's people and whatever thing you are trying to accomplish. And so you're going to get hit, and you're going to get hit hard. And if you just start running the race at the time right. of accepting... Oh, it's going to be extremely difficult. Yeah, that's why Paul told Timothy that that the new converts should not be leading, mm-hmm. right? In, you know, the assembly in that regard, and we're not disparaging leadership. No, not um, at all. Not at all. Um, it is. I mean, Christ picked twelve disciples um, who would become leaders. We're not disparaging that at all. But what we are doing is we're looking at the participation in the body of Christ. When we speak of church, we're not speaking of a denomination or a building. God help us. Um, We're speaking of the body of Christ. And in that regard, um, Jason, you were talking about Christ being the, um, the full revelation of the Godhead, you know, the incarnate revelation of the Godhead. Um especially during this season of, uh, if you follow any sort of liturgical year, we're in a season of epiphany. The idea is that Christ is the epiphany of God. He is the revelation of God. But we are in a different season in the church um, or in the body of Christ where the church is the new epiphany. 
um, the body of Christ Let is... That sink in. Yeah. I mean, we, we are together, not me as a minister, not you as a person, but together we are the body of Christ, which is the, the ministry to the world. And the problem with this concept of ministry as what I am called to is it tends to ignore and sometimes implicitly reject the corporate nature of the body of Christ and the epiphany of Christ that the church is to right. be. So so what that make how that helps me understand this is that those in full time ministry cannot function independently from those not in full time ministry in order to give a full revelation right. of Christ to the world. That's right. Well, dead, I don't think any dead of man us walking. Can, yeah, I don't think any of us can function independently alone, like when you're discipling somebody or whatever, it takes more than just yourself, because you're not Jesus. Yeah, right? it takes a village. Yeah, what? It, it ta- exactly. <laughs> I, I knew it's revelation for you, Jeff, but uh, <laughs> but we're not Jesus, and so we don't have all right. the answers. And where I struggle in an area, Jeff may not, and so it may be more beneficial for you to go and chat with him at that time in these areas that you're struggling with. And there are moments, Acts 6-4. Um, when ministry to the widows was being neglected or, or it wasn't being done, it wasn't being neglected, it just wasn't being done as well as it could be, um, Peter and the apostles, James and, and them stood up and said, you know, here in, in this position that we are, um, we need to give ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the word. Um, and, and they weren't taking away the responsibility of service uh, to others. They weren't saying, well, that's, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. That's beneath me. Um, what they were saying is that every, every part of the body has a place. Hmm. Um, and, and whatever position you're in, whatever title you bear, it's crap if we're not <laughs> serving, <laughs> if we're not serving in conformity to the body of Christ. People. Yeah, and I think I think what's important about that scripture that you just brought or that story that you just brought up is that the the apostles knew their place, they knew their role. Mm-hmm. Listen, we have to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, which the ministry of the word would not happen without prayer. Right. Because prayer is the place where they would communicate with the Father and then know his will, his heart, his mind, and then communicate that to others. Using scripture and using spirit, right? Mm-hmm. Revelation. They're sharing, discerning, prophecy, that kind of thing. That that ministry, connecting to the heart of God, giving that to others. Mm-hmm. So they're saying, hey, look, this we know our place. We need to do this. And so let's equip or uh, affirm some other people to devote themselves to the service to the widows, which was also a commandment to feed the poor, serve the poor, care for the widow right. and the orphan. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're doing what was God's will, but finding themselves in those in those roles and I think that's a huge that's a huge thing in this whole myth of ministry thing is that yeah maybe there's only in your church like if if you're a part of 80% or 90% of churches in in America you're probably part of a smaller congregation and um, or a smaller church whatever mm-hmm. and so there's probably only two or three four paid positions maybe some fo- volunteer positions so if all of those are filled and you can't step into that it doesn't mean that you don't have a role right, right? And, and so just because you're not called to be youth pastor or you're not called to be community pastor or you're not called to be worship pastor doesn't mean that there's not a calling on your life and so quit thinking that we have to fit into those five six seven positions and start to think outside of that and how's the Lord gifted you that's where we get into to you know spiritual gifts like service admit or yeah administration mm-hmm. uh, giving teaching those kinds of things like where where do you fall in that? How has the Lord gifted you? And then how can you go ahead and just do that to anyone everywhere, regardless of if your church has said you are now the minister of love? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, how do you, like, let's get out of that and start to function. And you got to know who you find are. the role. You yeah. got to know who you are. Um, Apest, apostles, Ephesians 4, God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Um, it's a five-fold model that fits every single person to some extent. We, every person fits somewhere in that model. Um, and, and part of what he's saying is, if you're a hand, quit trying to be a foot. Um, 
you know, and, and also recognize not one of us is ahead. Mm. <laughs> we're not the Can head. Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean. Yeah, we're not the head. We're not the head. Don't, we forget that though. Um, well, who's the, who's the, you know, whatever phrase we use, who's the lead pastor? Who's the, mm. uh, the head shepherd? Well, in all regards, that's Jesus. Um, should be. It should be. But if you, I mean, what is, what is your title on your website? I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But is a it lot lead of the pastor? Guy. I don't is it know. Lead pastor? It, it, I have no it's idea. The guy, the You're dude, the, yeah, the dude. The guy. The dude. And, the guy. and then below it, it says the dude abides. So <laughs> <laughs> we we all know abiding is good because Jesus said it, right? Yeah, but it's and interesting because you because you go you go to the website and it says lead pastor. So you look right. who's in charge, who's right. the guy I'm going right. to see, who's the main, you know, the primary minister, right. and it's okay. And does he have great hair? Who's here to serve me? That's is why. Basically that's what they're why you're for. struggling. This, this guy doesn't. How tight are his hey. jeans? How tight are his jeans? I guarantee you, jeans. mine are tighter right now. Right. That's true. I that's saw funny. you walking in. <laughs> the, yeah. I'm in yoga pants and mine are loose. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing yoga pants wrong, Jeff. <laughs> yoga pants on Jeff look like Jinkos in the '90s. <laughs> Oh gosh, that's funny. MC Je- Hammer. Oh, Je- Jeff in the seventies, he wore one bell bottom. <laughs> the other one just hung to the side. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. My part in the body was the right leg. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. So yeah, I think role role plays a big distinction, and I just think again, the the whole purpose of this thing is to be in Christ and to be close close to the Father, and so that when your identity is in Christ. You don't look for your identity in ministry. Right. Ministry is something that flows out of your identity. Somebody tweet that. Your ministry flows out of who you are in Christ. And so the more you begin to learn who you are, the more you'll begin to function in that. So um, for a long time, I was in a uh, – and, and so uh, Chris wrote something down over here. He, he put the burden of titles. And so for me, when I moved to Wichita from Houston to um, be a church planter – like I had that title put on me mm-hmm. and then I was, I was thrown into a, a world of church planting. And so of course there's this comparison trap of all these different church planters, right? Like, you know, Oh, he's a church planter. Mm-hmm. Well then I need to learn to function like he does or do what he does um, or be successful like that other church planters, planter is successful or speak the way that they speak or yeah, to speak the yeah. way that, or be as mm-hmm. charismatic or passionate or, or whatever get the results that they got get the results that they got right. So um, I had this, essentially it became a burden that I tried to fit this mold. And uh, it, it just one day I, I really asked myself the question. I was like, am I supposed to be the lead guy? Am I supposed to be the guy? I don't think mm. I'm supposed to be the guy. Maybe I need to be a number two or whatever <laughs> it is. But you know, really what it boiled down to was I then began to realize that the Lord has gifted me by his spirit, by his grace. I have this um, ability and this, um, I don't have to will forth. I don't have to work to you lead don't have or to teach. Doth. Right. I don't <laughs> have to do. Um, it's not something I have to force myself into. Mm-hmm. You get me in the conversation, I will naturally begin to go to the scriptures and kind of open them up and use them as examples and give stories and make relationships. It's who that's, you are. That's it's a your teaching na- gift. It's your natural bend. You don't have to try or strive. You, right. You just. It's like once you get in that lane, you just start going. You just go. You start coasting. And and I'm I'm a leader in the in that regard as well. So if you look at these grace gifts, Romans twelve, mm. I'm a teacher and I'm a leader. And so I began to look at that as who the Lord made me and what has naturally flowed out of the Spirit being active in my life and me um, submitting to the leading and the guiding of the Spirit. And so that what ha- that's what has begun to happen naturally. Yeah. And so I just flow in that now, mm-hmm. and I can do that now anywhere, regardless of if I am on pay. I'm not paid staff. I have that role as a leader in our organization, but I'm not paid to do it. And if the source went away, I would continue to do that in every area of my life, no matter where I was, around whoever I was. And I think it's that vocational it's, humanity. See, we. Hey, oh, we've we've made this. I we've we've gotten this this uh, twisted idea that being human is about how fallen we are. Christ came as true human to make us more human. Um, and when you recognize the humanity of who God has called you to be and what God has called you to do, those t- two things are never separate. The who mm. and the what 
in, in vocational humanity are never separate. And so when you rest in that, you begin doing what you were designed to do, and you become the human God has created you to be. Human right. is not a bad thing. God created us human. We need to stop saying, well, I'm only human. Um, <laughs> that, it's, that's wrong. We are becoming, the more Christ-like we become, Christ came to be the true human, and the more that we become like him, a scripture calls him the second Adam, mm, right? New yeah. creation. The more we become like him, the more human we become, and, and the who and the what, there is no divide. It, it's, it goes away. Who you are and what you do becomes one thing. Christ. Yeah. Christ. Did you have something? Nope. Uh, Jeff, I was going to say, I think it's time maybe we transition into. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about <coughs> the myths and what it's not and changing our mind and doing some of these things. But mm -hmm. let's, let's look at the scripture and yeah. talk about the call of humanity and uh, kind of how that went awry. And then how Jesus reinstituted that call for all believers. Yeah, man, it's such a... Um, if you've hung around with me at all, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, Nick. Sorry, uh -huh. sorry, Nick. If you um, want to know what, it, what it's like to hang out with Jeff, just look at Nick. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, that's then right. they would want to hang out with him. <laughs> oh, okay. well, yeah. Yeah, all right. yeah. I mean, right? right. <laughs> um, uh, but... Um, uh, you know, we, I, I like the big stories, the big narrative of Scripture. I find so much bad happening in the Bible when we begin plucking verses. And so I like looking for the, the, what I call the meta-narrative, the big story in there. Um, and the big story always begins in the garden. And we, when we start talking about vocation, um, I like the term vocation. It's so much better for me than all these other terms we've been using. So what does it mean, vocation? Yeah, vocation is, um, it, and even the way we use that sometimes is wrong. We, we talk about vocational schools and all of that. But vocation is so much deeper than just, um, just the accomplishment of a job. Vocation is the identity of who I am. And so vocation... Um, the Latin, vocare. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, we, need a, uh, we need to understand, though, that this, it, it means, it translates literally into calling. And I always like to mention the fact that if there is a calling, there is a caller. That's good. Um, and so vocation for us begins in the garden. Hmm. It's interesting that in the garden, God never said... To Adam and Eve, pre-fall, pre-Genesis 3. God never said um, to Adam and Eve that they needed to, um, they needed to go into ministry, they needed to <laughs> do any of these things. He, he, what he said was, he begins, the first words he says to them, directly to them, was a blessing. Um, and part of the blessing was the calling. He blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Um, you know, and then he says, fill the earth, subdue it, uh, steward it, all of these things. It, it's interesting. His blessing became, uh, was manifest in what he was doing, in what Adam and Eve were doing. Right. And so the calling is, is not just the title. The calling is what God ha how God has blessed us and what we are to do with it. And part of it, fill the earth, subdue, multiply, all of those things, steward, um, there is no part of creation that is exempted from that. Um, so vocation is our participation in the entire created order of God. It's, it's all of it. So, so essentially the, I, so let's, it, I was going to say essentially the call of Adam and Eve, but really what God was doing was he was giving them purpose. Mm -hmm. And, isn't it interesting? He says, he says to them, tend the garden and keep it. Keep it. Now, this was pre-fall. There was no sin to speak of. What, is it, what are you keeping it from? Um, and I see in this, this, this story, okay, so God creates, there's chaos, God creates the seven days, um, the seven moments of creation, however you want to parse that out, I don't care. Go to Branson and, <laughs> and, and all of that stuff and, and come back and tell me how I'm a heretic. 
Um, that's fine. Um, What's your email address? People can it's reach you. No, Jewish2000 <laughs> at yahoo.com. You, you want to hear that's something? my wife's email address, actually. <laughs> you you, you want to hear something funny? I actually had a dream last night that someone gave us a two star rating, and I was like reading it, and they were talking about how we were like terrible and stuff. So well, this might be why. This might so, be why. Yeah. It's me. This is what um, happens when you get Casey off but, the podcast. Yeah. We get but, two star ratings. Well, but we, however you want it, the, the creation, God brings it into order. Um, and he, cre- he establishes this order. Um, and in the, in the establishment of this order, then, he, it says he plants this garden. Um, read carefully. It doesn't say the garden of Eden until later. It says the garden in Eden. Watch the prepositions. The garden in Eden. Um, and so here is, we might even say this template. God says, okay, here's what I've done with all of creation. Now I'm planting this garden um, and I want you to fill the earth. I want you to expand and multiply, subdue, be stewards of it. But here's what it should look like. Here's the example. Now, my creative ministry, God says, I'm giving to you. So here's this model. Here's this garden. Tend it and keep it, but fill the earth and multiply the effects of this garden throughout creation. We're like, well, I thought all of creation was the garden. It's not what it says. Mm. Now, you are to manifest this. See, Already we're given vocation from the beginning. Um, And part of God's perfect order was humanity. And we were to bring the creative perfectness of God to the rest of creation. Um, And and that is a mind-blowing concept when you think of it because... It's such a greater purpose than what we give ourselves. And it's not a fallen purpose. See, we have rooted so much of our ministry in the fallenness of humanity. And this vocation was never a fallen purpose. It was a set-apart and holy purpose from the beginning, pre-fall. And, and, so, and he says, and I have given you authority to do this. He handed this authority, this creative vocational authority. He gave it to humanity. This is what it means to be human. Okay, so then Genesis 3 occurs, and all of a sudden, Adam and Eve stop listening to the God who created and gave them authority, and starts listening to the voice of this accuser, this, this adversary, this tempting voice. And essentially, in listening to this voice, they gave that voice a greater authority than the voice of God. Right, yeah. God who had given them authority, now they take this authority, and in a sense, by listening to him, did God really say? And they hand their authority... Right, they question, he questions it. Yeah, but they yeah. hand their authority off. Yeah. And they give their authority, what God had given to them, they give it to now to something else, something that's a part of creation. It, so it, this is just a question. I'm not trying to create new theology or anything like that. But um, so... I've always said, well, then they began to question God. Did he really say? So they questioned his word. And anytime we question his word, we get into trouble kind of thing. But in essence, were they, they were questioning their own authority then? Like, am yeah. I really yeah. 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 Um, who God says I am? And they can were, I really do what he says I can do? They were questioning their vocation. Yeah, their purpose. Their, their purpose. Yeah. Their purpose for even being. Right, because it shifts. Right. Right. So they had, okay, so you said something earlier. You said... God created uh, from chaos, from disorder. He inserts himself and creates order mm-hmm. from chaos. And this is essentially what he does. Like, as wayward children, we're just all over the place. And then he comes into our life, and then he disciplines us, or else we're illegitimate children, right? right. So he's like, I'm going to bring some order to that craziness. Structure. Structure. Yeah. So what he does is he puts us, obviously, he is in his rightful place, but then he puts us in our place, and he gives us his likeness, his image, he gives us creation, and then he gives us purpose. So we are in our place. Mm-hmm. And so once we function there, we are within the proper order of God, up, proper order of creation, proper order of purpose. So then right. when Satan inserts himself into it, he says, then you will be like God. So essentially he's saying, you are going to get things out of order. You right. want to put yourself where God is and have his knowledge and his understanding. And so we shift and we get out of order. Which, But that was God's purpose to begin with was to have, to look like him, to have his purpose, to have his knowledge. Um, the God complex comes when we want it apart from God. And that's what happens. And, and in that, there is a loss of vocational humanity, a, a loss of identity in who we are. 
And so now all of a sudden we stop, we stop seeing who we are in God and we start seeing what we're doing in the world and they become two different things. Um, and this so is we, the birth. We, we create a dichotomy that should never be one in the first place. It should have never been there. Right. Um, and we create a false order. It, it's, it's a false structure. It, it is a dust-based structure, not a God-breathed humanity. And you mean dust-based because of the fall? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, in essential, it, we're, we're created out of the dust, and, and the only thing that separates us from the dust is the breath of God. And when we stop, when we stop having that, that breath of God, the voice of God breathing into us, what are we? From dust you come, to dust you shall right. return. And it's interesting then that Jesus says, man will not live on bread, bread alone, alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so as God speaks and breathes into our life by his spirit and by scripture, right. but his voice, because he's living, then we receive life. Mm-hmm. Mm. So phenomenal segue right there. You I went, set that up. Yeah, you went, <laughs> you went automatically to Matthew chapter 4, because that line comes from Jesus' temptation in the wilderness with the Satan. Now, see the parallels of what's going on. Right, yeah, preach it. I know um, where you're going. Yeah, this is, remember, we handed off our authority to the, what later scripture would call the prince of the power of the air. How did the prince of the power, or how did the prince of the air get the power? wasn't his, and God didn't give it to him. We had authority, and we listened to this voice, and so any authority that this prince of the air has, it comes because we gave up our vocational right to it. We handed it off, and we allowed him to speak as if he was speaking truth into our life, and we adopted that truth as our own, and we fell. Our humanity fell. Um, so now Jesus is in the wilderness at the outset of what we would call his ministry, which we've already kind of discussed. Um, right. It but, was just who he was. Right. Yeah. And, and, but here he is. He goes into the wilderness, and we know the three temptations, the, the, um, the stones into bread. Um, man shall not live by bread alone, um, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Yeah, it's the rhema word. The rhema, yeah, yeah. and the spirit breathes. The spirit breathes. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, the second temptation is he goes to the temple, prove yourself. Um, it, you know, it does it not say, he didn't give a reference because there were no references, but does it not say in Psalm 22 that if he throws himself off, even the angels will lift, right, lift him up and all of this stuff. Um, prove yourself. Um, prove you are who you say you are. But then the last one is interesting. He takes him to the top of the mountain. And he shows him all of the empires of the world. And he says, all of this has been given to me, Hmm. who gave it to him. We did. We gave it to him. All of this has been given to me. Now, remember, Christ is the second Adam. Paul said that. Here comes Christ on the scene now. And he says, all of this has been given to me by the first Adam. He doesn't say that explicitly in this text, but we've got to see it there. That's really interesting because I've never noticed that Satan is saying all this has been given to me. To me? Hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that Jesus said, no, it hasn't. You're an idiot. (laughs) Which translation is that again? (laughs) (laughs) But he doesn't doesn't say that, which if I were Jesus, I would totally say that. Yeah. But the reality was is it had been given to him by humanity because God gave it to humanity. Now, humanity has given it to... Um, this adversary, all this has been given to me, and I will give it to you. Um, In other words, you can become the Lord of this. What was the temptation to Adam and Eve? You can have all of this without having to go through God, without having to go through God's plan. All you have to do is bow down to me because it's all mine. Mm. Um, And and Jesus, of course, says, away from me, Um, you know, and, and okay, so then the the three years of Christ's ministry, um, public ministry, we'll qualify (laughs) that. Okay, death, burial. He's being paid right now, so he's all good. (laughs) Right, death, burial, resurrection. (laughs) Even foxes have a place to lay, you know, dens. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Um, paid what? Um, Paid with the cross. Um, Oh. And uh, that's that was our remediation, which, by the way, um, is uh, should be the remediation of professional pastors is mm. you are paid with a cross that was an aside um yeah right well paul later he um he says to timothy look as ministers of the gospel we're content with food in our stomachs and clothes on our back mm. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, but continue. Make, yeah. yeah. So, so we get Bring to it home. we get we get through all this point. We come to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter twenty-eight. We call it the Great Commission, right? In that, that's profound. And we're going to preach it every time we have a missionary come into our church buildings, <laughs> and we're going to talk about this. But we miss the big E on the eye chart when it comes to this. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the big E on the eye chart. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the one everyone should be able to get. Can, can you read this one? Uh... Uh, <laughs> I may not be able to read it, but I've memorized it, right, <laughs> if nothing else. Um, but we miss this entirely. Um, Jesus begins not by saying, go and make disciples. He begins by saying, all authority in heaven and on Ooh. earth has been Ooh. given to me. Yes. How was it given to him? He took it back through the cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right um, at the beginning, when he when when the Satan was talking to him, Satan says, "All this belongs to me." Jesus did not say, "No, it doesn't." His response to Satan's indictment was the cross, where he took back because uh, because the authority that we claimed was an authority of death. Hmm. Um, uh, by listening to that voice, and so he took it right. back by, by dying by eating of. The fruit, and they right. said, if you eat of it, you surely you will surely die. Surely die. Yep. And Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Eat of this that you may live, yeah. right? And in the same way, I'm going to break myself open, um, which is interesting. Every time we share in communion, do, re- do you realize we're not just taking in the life of Christ. We're also saying <clears throat> we're going to be broken in the same way that the world can eat us, the same way it ate Christ. Ooh. And we will be consumed with the same kind of passionate ministry, vocational ministry. Um, that is, that's Eucharist. That's communion. It's not just this thing that we do that gives us magical powers. It is an act where we're saying we're going to be broken in the same cruciform way for the world. And so Jesus endures all of this, and he comes to this, and he says, now, through this, all authority has been given to me, therefore. What's the therefore mean? I give to you. Yeah. Ah, Go. Yep. yeah. Go. So, so he reinstitutes purpose and order. Yes, and right. he gives authority yep. back. Yep. He gives it back. And you remember God says at the outset... Um, when he blessed them, this is what Jesus was doing, he was blessing them, God at the outset blessed them, and he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, give order, I've set this template for you, now expand this template again and again and again. Now here's Jesus at the end, all authority, now I'm the second Adam, this is a new beginning, I'm the second Adam, now I have authority as the second Adam, and I'm giving it back to you now be fruitful and multiply fill the earth right go and make disciples <laughs> yes fruitful and multiply right right it that's huge right. that is huge that's vocational humanity um where we are becoming more human in that regard and i i just think if we understood this discipleship is not just about praying a prayer and making a convert discipleship is about bringing right. the kingdom of god to earth as it is yes. in heaven right <clears throat> And interestingly, so let's let's then talk about um, Jesus saying he was going to institute his ecclesia, mm. his church, mm. which is a people. But look, it's not just a bunch of people gathering into a building and singing songs and listening to a guy talk about things. Jesus was essentially taking a he was exercising his authority over the supreme authority over that that ancient world at that time, which was Rome. Mm-hmm. And so the term ecclesia was not used for a group of Christians. It was used for a secular ruling body who made the decisions from some place in Rome that as they they ruled and led and governed and made decisions, well, then they um, then activated their uh, their henchmen, essentially, their Roman soldiers and their governors that they had placed throughout Jerusalem and Israel um, to then say, Caesar says... So therefore, right? And mm-hmm. so Caesar was the, the reigning authority. But, you know, so there's this group of people who are governing and then working that out into They're the world. They're working towards a, a purpose. They're a working purpose. towards a purpose. So it, ha- it had everything to do with authority. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my ecclesia, my ecclesia, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it, he's, he's making 
a, um, a, a commentary on the spiritual nature of his kingdom because he did say, my kingdom's not of this earth. Right. So he's then t- making an affront also because it, we, we know it was like political and it was spiritual, right? Mm-hmm. So he was a political adversary mm-hmm. uh, according to, um, to Rome, but then also uh, the Pharisees. So there was those two aspects. So what I'm getting at is Jesus saying, I'm going to establish my governing body. And my people are going to rule and reign and govern and make decisions based on my will right. because I am the head. And so the decisions that I make are going to be worked out through this group of people. And so essentially being the ecclesia as believers in Christ, we're his body, governing body. Well, then we're coming into alignment with his heart, alignment with his heart and his will. And then we're outworking his kingdom into this earth. We're ruling and we're reigning in the same way that we were supposed to rule and reign when God gave us purpose in the garden. This is ministry. That's what it is. This is ministry. Nothing else. Um, Our polity and our politics are not of this world. King Jesus, it's his kingdom and it's his polity. (laughs) And I'm sorry. So define polity for those who don't know what it um, is. Let's just say say politics. Governing body. Yeah. Um, But... um, but but even the concept of politics in a broader term, our politics are not of this world, and if our if the empires of this world, um, if they if the politics of the empires of this world do not align with the politics of the empire of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, then we we must choose our loyalty, and in choosing our loyalty, we are defining which kingdom we are going to establish on earth. Um, I, I mean, that's, there's no, you can't serve two kings. And if Christ is our king, which is what we say, then we have authority in this world to establish a new type of kingdom. Do you know the ecclesia, the church does not exist um, to, to be a reflection of empire. The church exists to reflect the empire of God so that we become a microcosm, or one of my favorite authors, N.T. Wright, says microcosmos. That's more, that's broader. Yeah. Um, but, but the church is a microcosmos of the kingdom of God, so that we now, through cruciform living, not through waging wars, not through crusades, not through violence and mayhem, but through the kingdom of God and cruciform living, now we establish the order and the authority of God on earth as it is in heaven. Right. And, there, and there are some denominations in essence that have established themselves as the empirical religious force on earth. Mm -hmm. That's a really big phrase. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, right. We're, we are the empire being the religious right is wrong. Um, it, it is just absolutely wrong. (laughs) R I T E. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's just wrong. Um, we do not align to a, an imperial politic. We align to a kingdom of God politic, and that is that is it. Um, and the two cannot we cannot speak of loyalty to Christ. Right. So, in so any other way? Let, let's take this back to the Great Commission. Then mm-hmm. we all know it. Uh, all authority has been given to me. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So essentially, we are going to um, teach everyone everywhere, regardless of race, nation, right, all that stuff, regardless. Um, We're going to teach them to be learners of Jesus, Mm -hmm. which means teach people to be learners of Jesus, not learners of you Mm -hmm. or learners of your theology or of your denominational theological bend, Mm -hmm. right, or your disciplines, right? It's it's teach people to be learners of Jesus. So ultimately, my, my purpose in this life, and I've talked about this multiple times, but I'll just talk about it again. I feel more and more in my life right now that my existence, and, and the older I get, I realize uh, that more and more I am to, in every way possible, and in any way that I possibly can on a daily basis, is help point people to Christ in any way that I can. Mm-hmm. Like if I can be that instrument, that tool, if it's through a sermon, if it's through a podcast, if it's through you know, leaving a post-it scripture on the car. Like, I don't know what it is, but in any way, shape or form that I can help point someone to Jesus so that they have that personal connection with him or to point them in a way that maybe it's going to 
they are going to have some sort of desire for deeper intimacy and relationship with with Jesus and the Father. Well, then I feel like it, that, that that's what I'm here to do in any way possible. The second thing is I believe that um, going back to the Garden of Eden or the Garden in Eden, Eden means pleasure. Mm-hmm. And the Lord, uh, God created this, uh, he created creation for pleasure. He wanted us to right. find enjoyment in what he created, but also ultimately our enjoyment is found in him. And so I think it is totally fine, and I think it is God-honoring for on a daily basis that I can enjoy every aspect of every gift that God has given me. My wife, my children, my job, um, the food that I eat, the mm-hmm. coffee that I drink. Right. I can find enjoyment in all these things. And so really, you call me whatever you want to call me, but I think I can enjoy this life. And I know there's going to be hardships. I know there's going to be trial. But even Scripture tells us to find joy in those things. Mm-hmm. So in all things, we find joy, and in everything, I seek to help people be learners of Christ. And so ultimately, it's kind of the Jesus juke, but when someone's having a hard time, and we we can minister, we can give scripture, we can pray for them, um, but ultimately, we should end up at the question, well, what is God saying about it? Mm. Because are you connecting with him in that way? And that's what we're to be, be doing, making disciples, learners of Jesus, well, what do you think about this? I don't know. Why don't you go ask Jesus to show you, <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit will be, be our teacher. He'll teach us all things. We have the Spirit that's been given to us, and we have revelation. We have no need for a teacher, although teachers are given to the body for encouraging and uplifting and pointing people to Christ. Right. So I just think, personally, I've been able to boil that down, and it has helped me exist in a more um, burdenless way. Jesus said, my commandments are not burdensome. My mm-hmm. yoke is easy. It, my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, learners of Christ, disciples, right? And so it's, I, I just, I feel like I'm in such a better place now that I can just look at my purpose in life and say, I'm going to point people to Jesus in any way I can, and I'm, I'm going to enjoy everything around me that he's given me to enjoy. And I feel like that's God honoring, and I, feel, I don't feel guilty. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm missing out. I don't feel like I need to attain to anything. That's what I'm doing, and I believe that that's God honoring. And I believe it's yeah. it's vocational Minist- humanity. Ministry right? is not spiritual. It's just not because if we say ministry is spiritual, then what we're doing is we're separating the physical from the non-physical. The separation that you were yeah. talking about, yeah, yeah, and that's not um, the fruit in the garden. Eat, enjoy. Everyone's naked, right? I mean. <laughs> That's, whoop, whoop. that's a good day. Freaking hippies. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and so, I mean, enjoy all of this. And wakey, even, wakey, <laughs> eggs while nakey. Huh. Mm-hmm. That'll preach. Um, <laughs> I think. I'll make it preach. Um, but uh, but it, we, we tend to think that, that ministry is just ministering to the spiritual. Look at Jesus' ministry, um, what we would, the three years that we have on record. Um, If anyone was naked and you clothed them, you did this to me. If they were thirsty and you gave them a cup of cold water, that was me. Um, Sermon on the Mount, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the left. If, um, you know, all of these aspects, those are so tangible. They're physical and they're real. Tangible Kingdom, isn't that a book that's written? It is. It's a great book. And actually, you've been reading it? Yeah, Yeah, he talks about, he talks a lot about that. You know, the reason I think that a lot of people believe that ministry is spiritual is because we don't know how to speak gospel in everyday life. Like, how do you go into somebody's hurt and pain when they're going and dealing with cancer, the loss of a child, or, you know, a crappy day at work and speak gospel to that? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the gospel in the middle of all that? And um, we have done a disservice to people by making the gospel all about the afterlife and not about this life. Ooh. The, the, Gosh, the so then and so there true. rather than the now and here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. Would you like to expound on that? <clears throat> well, I have some tools that. Uh, tell us. That tell us about good. them. So, um, I, I went to a conference. minus the ones at this table, right? <laughs> well, there's a couple in the middle. <laughs> hey oh. oh, wow, wow, wow! They at least we're cut. at least we're great tools. <laughs> Well, they so we went to a conference, the M nineteen conference, and it was all about mission and evangelism and and stuff like that. And one of the the people that were there, the teachers, they talked about um, mission uh, or 
Yeah, mission, discipleship, and evangelism are not uh, friends. And they said discipleship and, and evangelism are not enemies. It's so much more than that. It's a marriage partner. Um, and so it's these things that bring, you, you have to bring them together because you can't have one without the other. Mm. And so there are benefits to Sunday morning church. Like I went through this whole process of does does the church, going to church, do anything for me? It's like, is it necessary? And uh, I struggled with that. And like, what's the benefit? Where's the value? Mm-hmm. Um, the value is that I get to come and see other believers who are on this journey with me. It's a family reunion every week. Um, Should be, yeah. Yeah. Whether you like your family or not is irrelevant. So uh, <laughs> you need to be there. Ah. <laughs> you need to be there to because that encourages you. Um but one of the tools that they they provided, and you can find it on organicoutreach.org, um, is this one degree rule. So the one degree rule is basically you have a scale from one to ten. It's you're taking your your temperature. Uh, you have a scale of one to ten, and if 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 I get up in the morning and I make my task list and I write down everything that I need to accomplish and everything I need to get done. And I leave the house and I start accomplishing all this stuff and I get on on board and I have 90% of the stuff done that I need to have done before noon and it's a good day. I'm driving home and get done with my day at work. I'm driving home and thinking all the stuff I didn't get done. And then I get to the house and I'm making my list for tomorrow. Essentially, I am at a one on this temperature scale. And counter that with the next day. I get up and I pray and I go through all the tasks that I'm that I have the same task, the, the exact same task. But instead of just the task, I think of the people that I'm going to encounter, the people that I'm going to talk to, the conversations I'm going to have. And I start praying for those conversations. Um, and I go throughout the day and I have those conversations. And then at the end of the day, I come home and I'm like, okay, so on these conversations, I said this, I should have said that should have said this, you know, was this conversation good? Was that conversation good? And I'm thinking about all the people that I encountered in the conversations I had. That's basically a 10. So the goal is not to always be at a 10. That, that, that's not the goal. The goal is to move from one degree. So if you're at a three that day, the goal is to be at a four tomorrow. Um, and you can go, like I said, to that website, organicoutreach.org, and find all these tools that give them away for free mm-hmm. because they want people to know um, they, they want people to be able to do this. I think a lot of the problem that we have essentially is that we tend to think that the goal is to get somebody to say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus and say that prayer. Yes. Um, yeah. That is not the only goal. As right. a matter of fact, you know, one of the scriptures that people often quote is, the truth will set you free. But there's a scripture right before that that says, if you walk in my ways, right. the truth will set you free. Discipleship happens before belief. There are those people who have this come to Jesus moment instantaneously. That doesn't happen for everybody. Mm-hmm. So you are there to walk alongside somebody in the everyday aspects of life. Yeah, and, and the not so glamorous and the outside of of the church walls. I, I even know that that's a oxymoron in itself, but. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, I've been very. Cool. I've been. I've just been processing everything. That's yeah, I looked being over said. and I'm like, "Are you okay?" Yeah, no. <laughs> I've just. I'm taking it all in. I'm. I'm processing, and you know, even even now, I'm even trying to figure out, man, what do I? How, how do I feel about full time ministry for me personally, and 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 the definitions and the titles and all that, and you know, with with the model that our our church has shifted to recently, I. There, there's almost been this identity crisis, you know, it's not, I'm not, I'm not teaching, you know, as often as I was actually, this is tomorrow will be the first time that I teach. And like, it feels like for, I think it's been three months. And so there's been a part of that that's been ah, refreshing and, and it's good. And, and I've been able to focus, but there's also a part of me that is even evaluating the word pastor. It's so interesting. I had a conversation with someone here not too long ago, and I've been finding myself in this conversation more and more, but when someone will ask, "Hey, what do you do for a living?" and uh, and so used to be, well, well, I'm a pastor, you know, I'm a this and that. And, I, I hate. That <clears> yeah, I don't. I, it be, it's it's awkward either way. It's awkward because they're either going to elevate you or or lower you. And so it's just a weird. There's a weird thing. But and, you know, I, so I'm a photographer, so I was I'm able to say, "Oh, 
I'm a photographer, and I, and I used to be a pastor, and then I kind of stopped on the way home, and I was thinking about that, and and I, and this is weird. This may just me be me, but I don't know that I want to take on the title of pastor, although what I am doing in my home every single week is absolutely 100% pastoring people. And I would argue now that in this, how we are choosing to represent the body of Christ in our context allows for 100% more opportunities to pastor. But, you know, Jason, I think that I can kind of relate to the burden of of having this title on me, and and maybe that's just something, and I'm in a season where I need to work through that, and I need to process that, and I'll come out on the other side of it, but I think I'm in a season right now to where I just, I don't, I don't want that title, but I absolutely am and will continue to do the work of pastor. Right, so it's the role versus the title. You, yes, what, yes. What you are naturally yeah. doing, because you're caring for people, you are, in essence, shepherding or pastoring people because Christ in you compels you to do that when you're interacting with people versus you've taken the vocation, right? right. And then right. You, you've now separated it from who you are all the time to now just something you do because you get a paycheck. To yeah, absolutely. And a lot of this is intentional because what we're trying to do in our community is is we're very much so trying to let you know the eight, six other families in our, in our community that meet in our home you are a pastor in every single thing that you do, where you work, where you live, where you play, where you learn. You are on mission every single day. And there's almost a part of me that feels like I'm one of the guys. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm working. I'm working it. I'm punching in the clock, like you said earlier, Jeff. And I, and I guess there's some intentionality. And I want people to know you don't have to carry this title. You don't have to feel that burden. You don't have to get a check while well, I'm not against checks. I'll gladly take a check. Um, but I'll write you a check. Thank you. I appreciate it'll, that. It'll, it'll pass or you know, yeah, it'll clear. bounce. <laughs> yeah. But, but I absolutely, and I think this goes back to our heart behind this episode is we mm. want people to know that right. you are ordained, called right. and, and encouraged to go forth and do whatever God has called you to do in, in his context. And we all have this overarching mission that he sent us on. And, and so for me, I think I'm really just trying to show the people that I'm around that you can do this. You mm-hmm. can do this. It's not as hard as you think it is, but it is harder than you think it That's is. That's right. It, it, it's this weird... What was what was the title that Jesus... Jesus' favorite title he, he gave to himself? Son of man. Mm-hmm. Not pastor. Not lead apostle. Right? We've even made this the, the position of apostle almost elevated beyond the ministry of Christ himself. Yeah. And the, the title, if ever there was a title that Jesus took, it was, it, and he did, ascri- he did um, speak of himself as a shepherd, uh, which is s- synonymous the good with shepherd, pastor. Yeah. yeah. But his favorite title was right out of Daniel, and it was a son of man, mm-hmm. son of man, which means he subjected himself. But, so, d- son of man... Mm-hmm. Can you just ex- expound on that just a tad? What did he mean by that? Yeah, what did he mean? Well, you'd have to go back and read Daniel. In Daniel, it, he speaks of being um, one, you know, um, before the throne of the Almighty, there was one um, as a son of man. So the the article, you wanted an English <coughs> lesson, right? Um, yes. The article in there is not the, um, what we call a definite article, it is an indefinite article, a a son of man, one as a son of man, um, and now before the throne, but of course there is this missional movement of the one as a son of man going um, uh, as, as a liaison between the Almighty, the, the El Shaddai. Um, but now Jesus takes that, and he, sa- he refers to himself as the son of man, almost as a, 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 as a prototype, an archetypical um, what Paul would later call a second Adam. Yeah. Um, and so here he comes, but he adopts the title as consummate humanity, essentially. That's what he's saying. I am essentially human. Now, the thing that blows our mind is while being essentially human, he was still essentially God. Yes. I, we don't pretend to understand that. Martin Luther um, said, uh, said he added to his, um, his divinity humanity. So that nothing was taken away, it was added it was onto. Added to, yeah. yeah. But it was. But he was fully and essentially human. 
the Son of Man. So in that capacity as the Son of Man, he comes in service to all of humanity. This was the title he took on himself. This was his vocation, was a vocation of service to humanity, which essentially, if we will come after Christ, that is, that is what we do. And how we serve, and I, I know this sounds very base and almost bottom shelf, but how we serve a cup of coffee in the morning to someone cranky in the drive through who's saying, you guys are way too chipper, <laughs> right, um, for this time of the morning. Um, but how we serve humanity in every moment of our life is our vocation and it is our ministry. And in that regard, the title that we adopt is first and foremost, ones who belong to Christ. We are Christians. We are little Christ. Sons and daughters. Sons of the and living daughters. God. Yes. And so in that regard, we must adopt the same title. Right. So where he is the son of man, now we go back to Daniel and we say we are a son of humanity. We are a daughter of so, humanity. So here's an interesting thing to consider. Um, there's this powerful phrase that Paul uses multiple times through his writings, and it's in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to talk titles <laughs> and we want to talk vocation, let's start looking at what you are and who you are in Christ. What right. is your title in right. Christ? You're beloved. You're yeah. forgiven. You're precious. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, right? You're for, again, forgiven. You're sanct you're sanctified. You are raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenlies, right? You are all of these things. And so let's start looking at what if we just looked at those titles more than we looked at the titles that man would give us. And let's look at the titles that God gave us. Mm. Oh snap. That's right. But seriously though, how much would that change? Well, it would change. It would change how we lead children in the quote unquote sinner's prayer. Well, all you need to do is invite Jesus into your heart. Scripture doesn't talk about Jesus coming into our heart very often. It talks about us being in Christ. Oh, you know what Scripture talks about? Giving you a new heart. Don't invite him that's to right. the one that's already busted and broken. Right. Ask him to that's give good. you a new one. Yeah. Let's keep this going. Yeah, heart, like of, this. heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. Right. Ezekiel I don't need 36. you in my heart. Yeah. I need this one gone. Right. Get cool. it out of here. And, and I don't need you to come in. I need <laughs> to be in you. You know, we are in Christ. We are seated in Christ. That is the language of of scripture, not Christ in you. I mean, Paul talked about that, but that is not the first movement. The first movement in this is us in Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy I always use um, in a homiletics, a homiletic setting, um, in a preaching setting. Because you tight. Because you tight. I always talk about... We'll have to bleep that one out. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that'd be um, funny. We bleeped homiletics. Bleep. Like, we're not saying that on this podcast. <laughs> Un unnecessary edits. Who does that? It's hilarious. Um, but um, um, but, uh, um, but it, in a preaching setting, I remember, I've used this analogy several times, but take a five-gallon bucket to the middle of the Pacific, maybe, maybe over top of the Marianas Trench, the, the Challenger Deep, mm -hmm. deepest part of the, the ocean, yeah. seven miles deep, and maybe even cut the bottom out of this five-gallon bucket. Now... Um, the regular Christian model is go out in the boat into the middle of the ocean of God's love and scoop up a bucket full. Get you a bucket full of God, right? And now go through life, and that's going to slosh all over the place, and that's what discipleship means is we're just going to get everyone wet with Jesus. Well, that's kind of stupid because Jesus is in me, right? The problem is, is he runs out eventually, and then we end, up, um, we end up in ministry depression because we have nothing left. The better model is not Christ in me, which is, again, I do not want to ignore those, those Pauline texts. But the first model is me and His Christ. His name was Paul, not What's, Pauline. Pauline. Now well, that was... <laughs> Paulina, yeah. I mean... Paulina. Um, you know, um, 20, 21st century. Did you just assume um, his gender? <laughs> he was wearing a robe. Who knows? Um, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> What's under your robe, man? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Uh, Show it to you? <laughs> Show it to you. Uh, 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 but, uh, but now, go back to the same spot. Rather than scooping a bucket, of getting you a bucket of Jesus, now cut the bottom out of that bucket and drop that bucket. Just drop it, right? Challenge your deep. And now here you are. Is Christ in you? Yeah, I suppose. 
But the better thing is you're in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and if Christ is in you, yeah, there's this aspect where you are, you are completely full of Christ, but you are the smallest part of the equation. Correct. And now with the bottom cut out, Christ is in you, he's flowing through you, he's moving in and out in your midst, and there's so much more Christ than there is you. And the, and 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 the expanse of that is bottomless, and the the breadth of it is eternal, and there's nothing to run out of except you. The only thing that runs out is you. Dang. Um, and that that's that's cruciform living, and that's vocational humanity, where the bottom is cut out of our life. Wouldn't it be great? We talk about being cut off at the knees. Um, there is redemptiveness in that, in being cut out from underneath, so that you realize there's no bottom to me anymore, and it's Christ in me. What is that statement? Something along the lines of, the only thing limiting how much you're filled is the amount of emptiness that you're bringing. That is right. Yeah. You bring emptiness so that you can be filled. A metaphor that I'm going to be using um, tomorrow, so... um, Nick, act surprised. Yeah, Yeah, act surprised. (laughs) Show us your best surprised Um, face. (laughs) Hold on. <laughs> that, hold that's on. it. That's show, it. Show it one more time. One more time. One more time. <laughs> that's a surprise face. <laughs> that's it. That's that all. looks like his disappointed face. <laughs> well, that's what I get from my that's, inappropriate that, jokes, but not from Nick. That's, that's the only one that laughs. That's what I look like when I listen to you preach. <laughs> <laughs> really, most most of them look like this. You know, oh gosh, eyes closed, yeah, head yeah. down. Um, but we have to check their pulse to make sure you're alive. <laughs> that's right. But the idea of having having this bottom cut out of our life. Um, going back to the garden, um, you know, our life, the image of God in us is, and, and is like, we are supposed to be like a mirror or a window where the glory of God shines into us. And then as a result of that, the glory of God shines through and out from us. Um, that's the ideal. That's what it's supposed to be. We are image bearers of God. That's vocational humanity. Um, what happens then is, is fallenness gets our windows or our mirrors dirty. Hmm. <laughs> and so now, um, and well, that's sin. Yeah, that's sin. But sin is so much bigger than just what I do. Sin is the fact that I'm living in a very fallen world, and my window gets dirty just by being in it, dust of the earth. That's good. Um, that's real good. And so it gets dirty. So then uh, what happens then is the glory of God has troubles getting in, and the glory of God has troubles getting out. Right. Because if it's not in, it's not out. Um, and so... so then what is the purification of the glass of our life? It's the tears of our lament. It's confession. It's repentance. And, and in, in weeping and in shedding these tears, what is happening? There is a purification that occurs in our life. And, of course, Christ is crying out in the garden, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And his tears become a, tears of, a tear of lament. Even God says, I've stored up your tears in heaven. And in this sense, um, the bottom is cut out from our lives when, when we recognize just how dirty and perverted everything around us has become. And it cuts us out, and it cuts us to the quick, and we recognize, ah. Uh, what a wretched man I am who will deliver me yeah. from this body of death. And it points us to Christ. Right. Well, and I think, I think that um, as far as like your confession and stuff like that, sin still holds such great power mm-hmm. over us. And, and this is a journey I've been on recently. Um, and I've kind of had my mind changed about sin. And, and in that just through list, listening to the Life School podcast and stuff, they talk about sin is just a, an area of manifestation, a manifestation of an area of unbelief in your life. And so that, to me, makes it easier to confess something to somebody else that believes that way, too, right? So somebody that may not believe that way, if I go and confess whatever, I've got a porn addiction or something like that, like, well, I can't believe, what? You're a Christian? You're not supposed to have anything like that? But if I know that that person believes the same thing, the same way that I believe as far as that just... It doesn't have that same power, right. right? And so it's like I can go and talk to talk to you and say, "Look, this is an area that I'm struggling to believe in." And you know, what is that thing behind the thing? What is that <laughs> the reason that I believe this way? And, and let's get to the bottom of it so that way it doesn't hold the same power over me. And I think if more people believe that, the confession would be easier to one another. Because the authority we have comes from Christ. We right. can emasculate the power <clears throat> structures of this world. Yeah. 
We have a, a question that came in on Facebook. It says, do you think this has to do with why Jesus told Peter he had to allow him to wash his feet? Daily dirt or sin we come into contact mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. What, do you, what do you guys think about that? I, short answer is yes. Um, remember... Now for the long answer. Yeah, remember, <laughs> remember um, Jesus, after that, had to give Peter a hygiene lesson, right? Um, well, because Jesus is like, if I, if I don't do this for you, you can't be a part of me. And Peter's like, well, then, then wash me from my head down. Mm. And Jesus was like, Peter, you're missing it. Remember, you took a bath this morning, right? Once, once you're washed, it's, it's okay. This is not the issue. Um, but it's the issue of the feet in particular and open-toed sandals, with socks is a sin, by the way. Um, Not so- true. Yes. Sandals Nick, with socks. you sinner. Sin. It's a sin. <laughs> I'm wearing um, those tomorrow. Wickedness. Um, I and, just got off work. <laughs> and, but, uh, and then you should lean back and then put your feet up on the chair oh, in front sure. of you. So that it's happening. And, I'm, I'll take a picture. Yeah, yeah. Flip-flops. <laughs> right. And, yeah. Oh, um, but but uh, Jagged big toe sticking right, out the edge. Right. Um, <laughs> no manicure. <laughs> yellow toenails. It's going to be It's going to be It's going to be wonderful. So hygiene yeah. lessons. Um, so... so so, so he goes through this, but, but here, think about the way that they were walking through the world. For us, this analogy doesn't work as well, um, but here's dusty roads where the primary mode of transportation was walking on the same paths that donkeys and oxen and everything else. You can imagine, have you ever been in a parade where there are horses? And cops on horses, right? Just imagine go. that, yeah. And then that's just how it is all yeah, the time, everywhere. all the time, yeah. And so, so this idea is as as we go through life, you know, go and make disciples. We're going to get the dust of the earth, and we should. If if in our churches, if our feet if our feet are always clean, we're not doing ministry. Um, and and Jesus comes and says, I will I will purify you of this, but now you need to be purified in the same way, and you need to go and be the purification for others. This is my ministry given to you to go and do likewise. Um, and so, yeah, there, right, yeah. we've got right. to encounter the dust. Um, I well, remember... It goes back to that story, that uh, the video that you showed on a Sunday night about the guy that was preaching, and the homeless mm-hmm. guy came up to him. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, it was so good. Yeah. Um, who was that? I forget. Um, oh, 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 um, Brooklyn Tab. Um, I can't think of the dude's name. Great book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Um, we'll look it up later. Anyway, yeah. yeah shoot me um, a text. It'll come to me. Um, but anyway, yeah, a homeless guy came in, and it was, it was like Easter services, and he was worn out, and he had preached two or three services, and this guy comes up, and, and he wanted to separate himself, obviously. He wanted to separate himself. He said, I could smell the guy coming all this stuff, and he, and he stopped and he prayed, and, and, he, and he tells the story in his own words, and it's longer even than what I would share, um, but uh, he goes through this, and he says, basically, the Spirit of God inhabited me in such a way that his odor became a perfume in my life. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, and he Jeez. says, literally, it, it was a literal perfume. Jim Cimbala. There it is. And, um, and, and he ends up, he, Text that to me. he's praying, he's I praying will. with him, he's hugging him, they're weeping together, and this... And this becomes a moment of profound redemption for both of them, not just for one for the other. And that's the key with, with vocational ministry in terms of our daily life is it's not just don't think that you're just serving the redemption of someone else. You're serving your own redemption by serving the redemption of someone else. It's and equal redemption. That, that's really an interesting thought. Imagine that if um, what was once a rancid or putrid smell became a scent or an aroma of opportunity for the love of Christ to manifest. Dude, I get to smell that smell every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like so it, it, it impacted yeah. me. And yeah. so when I went yeah. to work, like hauling trash is not fun. Hauling trash is not glamorous. I know what I yeah. put in my trash can. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Nick. And so, but it's like, <laughs> but after I saw that video, it, it like it Change causes me to pray. And, and, yeah. and like I encounter these homeless people two or three times a week in the trash can, like almost dumping them. Yeah. Uh, that's happened a few times, not, yeah. not actually if, dumping them, but getting close. If yeah. you don't smell like the people you're serving, you're doing it wrong. Ooh. Mm. Oh, snap. Yep. I mean, you're just doing it wrong. I remember once, um, I was clearing out a, an open help. We had, we had done a demolition project and, um, 
there was this kind of open cistern, open well, but it, it, it dumped sewage. So mm-hmm. pipe in, dump sewage, pipe out, pump it out to the, the station. It was just this open well. In the process of demolition, we accidentally filled in part of this. And it was so narrow, we couldn't get post hole diggers down there. We couldn't. The only thing we could get down there was the skinny preacher. Mm. And so I went down at first, you know, just scooping dirt, and we had to lift it out in ice cream pails. So there's a guy up above me, and I'm handing it up to him. And the deeper we got, (laughs) the muddier the water became (laughs) and the ground became. And that's when I discovered every time I look up – I opened my mouth because <laughs> because I looked up and I'm lifting this wet bucket up and it dripped, right? Oh. Open mouth, right? Yummy. And mm. I know what I'm scooping. Um, and at the time, it was a church in Iowa I was serving. And um, were you a pooper scooper? I was. I was. Mm. And he had you know, a number two. And at first. <laughs> At first, I was like, you know, I had the gloves on, and I was like, you know, I'm going to stay clean in the process. I thought you were going to say, at first, I was afraid. I was petrified. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. That's good. You probably wish it was petrified. Yeah, I wish. (laughs) Right, right. Um, But I, you know, the the lower I got, the muddier the water got, and all of this until I'm down and I'm seeing the pipes, and it's like, and I knew where this pipe came from, and I knew the people who was pushing water through that pipe that I was now scooping. And, um, and I remember crawling out of that hole, and at one point I was trying to stay clean, and then eventually you just kind of give you up. You just get it, yeah. You just, you, I'm there. Right, right. And it's, it's over me, and, and I crawled out of that hole stinking like the people I serve. Hmm. You, you how, know? how often, though, in ministry, or it just in, in, in general, do we try and keep ourselves from being knee deep mm-hmm. in in the crap of other people's lives. That's right. That's right. Like someone's yeah. having a hard time or, you know, going through a divorce or struggling with That's addiction. Location. And then we those are extra grace required people. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. But then we we purposefully, you know, we try and distance ourselves or we're like, well I don't even know what to do or I don't know how to help or I don't want to get myself mixed up into that because that's just a messy situation. Yeah. You know, I, and I'd love to speak to that. You know, we're, even even our conversation now as we're talking, I, I still feel like there's a bend towards full-time vocational ministry. Yeah. And, and I want to take just a slight shift in, in towards people who are everyday living. I mean, mm-hmm. people who are normal, unquote, unquote, normal people who, who haven't accepted the call into full-time ministry. Let me clear my throat. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. I don't know what that reference is, but okay. okay. Um, <laughs> and as we've started, <laughs> as we've started to shift, actually, I'm just going to speak for my wife and I's our, our life right now. We've started to make a shift into intentional living, very, very much so, trying to build margin into our lives because that's where ministry happens. Ministry happens in the margin, and for so many mm-hmm. people. You know, a book has margins built into it. You know, the words don't run all the way to the end of the page. There is margin built in there. And and our and, lives are... And on your Kindle. Too. And, and on our Kindle, yeah. too. Our lives are supposed to have that margin. And when they don't have that margin, when we're burning the candles at both ends, right. we don't have time for anyone else. We don't have time for the person that comes up to us. And, and when you say, how are you doing? And they say, oh, actually not good. You think, oh, crap, I don't have time for this. Like, I, I got to go. That's such yeah. I'll pray for you. Yeah. And, and so if you are somebody who wants to step into starting to live like Christ mm-hmm. and starting to be amongst the people, you have to make time to be amongst the people. You have to have margin built into your life, and it has to be intentional. You have to build rhythms into your life to where you can actually be Jesus to people. I mean, the the, the shown Jesus versus the spoken Jesus is so much more powerful in the life of a non-believer right. or, or, right. or somebody who has yet to encounter that. I mean, people hear about Jesus all day long. How many people experience Jesus from others? It's not very common. I mean, it it's common for those who build margin into their lives. And so a great first step is to begin to... An, analyze your life. Do I have time to stop and be with people? And that's how you begin to smell like the people that you're around is when you have time. Yeah. You make that time. And and the best way to do that is not by saying, well, I need to add this to my already crazy schedule. The idea is you need to take something away. Yeah. Um, 
that is part of sacrifice is is taking something away that is going to allow that margin because this is not about burning vocation is never about burning yourself out and giving glory to christ for being a wreck yeah he doesn't honor that no he's he's not about that life no i mean there's sabbath principle in this Mm -hmm. and and sabbath is a command it is a command it's not optional and we we poo poo it um another number two analogy (laughs) um but uh we we brush it aside and and we've almost made it in full-time ministry we've almost made it a badge of honor about how hard we work and how How you doing brother just busy just busy busyness busyness is a choice that's right that is right but and so what you talked about reminded me of what rich mullen said he said you know in the the movie ragamuffin um Mm -hmm. excellent movie i really enjoyed it but he said, I didn't become a Christian because somebody explained the nuts and bolts of Christianity to me. He said, I became a Christian because somebody was the nuts and bolts of Christianity. Mm-hmm. It does, and yeah, it doesn't right. happen enough. It's so much easier to explain <coughs> Jesus to someone than show Jesus to them. It's a hundred times Very easier. True. Very yeah. true. It, it, it doesn't cost much but a couple breaths. Yeah, and, and the truth is, it's really, it's, it takes time. And it takes even, not redundancy, but multiple consistency. consistency for someone to say, I look back and every time that I was in a rough place and I called you, you took the time to mm-hmm. talk to me. Whether it was five minutes, ten minutes, or an hour, or three hours in your living room. So they look back and they uh, essentially add all those times together and then they make the statement, you've always been there for me yeah you someone can't say if you've been there, well technically they can say if you've been there one time for them you've always been there for them but again <laughs> it's it there's a relational aspect to it mm-hmm. that over time consistently you have shown love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and honor or whatever it is and so it accumulates it's not so yeah it's essentially you have to build that in and um and slow that slow down I almost, I almost said something profane. Um, <laughs> slow, slow down, um, because we we take such pride in how fast we move. Um, and a profound thought that has been going through my my mind for a couple of months now is this concept of a three mile an hour God. Um, the average walking speed is three miles an hour, and God somehow for. 33 years saw fit to move at three miles an hour. Yeah, God unless, did. Unless he was on the donkey, but it's probably about the same speed. Well, and there were big crowds. Unless, he, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, it may have been slower. Um, but, um, but, you know, here he's, uh, how, do you, how do you move with someone? Walk with, and, and I mean that, I don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. Walk with them. Stop. Yeah, yeah. And, and and don't put expectations on your time with people. I, I think that one of the one of the worst things, one of the myths, and we'll just the myths of ministry is that ministry has to involve you talking about Jesus or sharing the gospel in in every conversation. And in a lot of ways, we've we've beat ourselves up and we've made the gospel about us in our part in it. Listen, you can sit down and be with someone and just be with them right. and just talk about whatever. And consistently, when you do that consistently, that is a better representation of the gospel. And, and listen, God will give you the go-ahead, and he'll give you the, the cue to share the, I mean, if you want to go textbook, textbook gospel. It will happen. You don't have to worry about that. But I think we've placed such a this big burden on ourselves that I got to do it. They could die in a car crash home, and Let, and you know this could happen. And let's also bust the myth of ministry is that ministry is only for lost people. That's right. Oof. Your brother and sister in Christ, more so as a brother and sister, and as somebody who is gifted by the Spirit. Many of your gifts are meant for the body, mm-hmm. dude. I, I I'll be vulnerable for a minute here like last year was a, a I rough my timer. a rough year for me um i lost a cousin who was the same age as me we grew up together mm-hmm. and uh dude she's 41 and died of a heart attack mm-hmm. and uh, they said oh it's natural causes i'm like there's nothing natural about that and no, uh you know a couple months later i lost my grandmother to cancer uh, lost a a friend that i was ministering to 
and I did his funeral and uh, it was like a month after that and it was just time after time after time and it was like I just needed somebody to talk to and uh, I'm, I've made that statement busyness is a choice many times to different people and then they always follow up with, yeah but like, mm. you can't say but <laughs> like it, it is a choice and I just needed somebody there and, and thankfully there were there were a few people that were there like when I called I was like hey I just needed to talk I needed a distraction I didn't necessarily need somebody to say, well, that sucks. Let me pray with you because, you know, God works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I Don't just wanna, you know the dude, Bible? Dude, I just want to give you a big finger when you say that to me yeah. in that situation. Right. Yeah. Which one? Show our listeners. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you <laughs> listeners. <laughs> you show our watchers. <laughs> you want to you know what's really interesting? And I, I mean, I'll be vulnerable in this situation as well, is, is during that season when my friend was hurting, I was knee-deep in ministry and Nick, I remember, I mean, we had a conversation mm-hmm. about this. You you called me up and asked if if we could go to lunch. And and guess what I was in the middle of doing that I couldn't stop to, to oh, spend I know. I know the answer. <laughs> to spend time with my friend. I was writing hairdressing. I was writing my ser- yeah, hairdressing. <laughs> I was writing my sermon that week and I was so stressed out. Mm-hmm. And I said, Nick, and, and and you know, I I knew a little bit about mm-hmm. what was going on in your life at that time, but but I stopped and I, I said, "Dude, man, I'm sorry. I got this message. This is the only time I have to write this and da, 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 and this and that and 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 hurt my friend. And I was not able to be and, there for him. And ironically, that was it a sermon about how we should serve others? It was. I don't know. Maybe I listened. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's the that's a perfect right. example of of in my life when I was burning the candles at both. And this yeah. wasn't even that long ago. I mean, right. this was." Less than a year ago, maybe eight months ago, I don't know. But August is when I lost my cousin. I mean, it was it was right around that time, 2018. I mean, here we are, February 2019, and and that's something I regret. And I mean, since then we've you only hate me a little bit now, but <laughs> but but people, not pulpit, is yes. ministry. Yes, mm-hmm. Love yes, absolutely. You know that. that. Say it again. People, not pulpit, is ministry. Yeah, 100. Um, percent And I, um, I'm not going to be vulnerable. Um, but <laughs> but I, I did remember. you not watch our first episode about <laughs> vulnerability and honesty, <laughs> but, especially from those in leadership? Right, right. That's um, before he was a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I I do remember once with you know it, because some of what we're talking about needs to also transpire very close to home. It's ministry is easier outside of our own immediate families. Mm, yep. Um, oh, yeah. It's so much easier to serve the needs of everyone else and ignore the needs of the people that depend on you the most. And I remember um, I was sitting out on our back deck one once, and um, I just had my Bible open, and honestly, I was just reading, just reading the Word. Um, that that doesn't those moments don't happen as often as they should or as I would like. But I was just I was just chilling, and it was a beautiful day, and the birds were out, and I was like, I'm going to read the Bible. And i um, sitting out there, and my son comes up on the deck, and he's like, he starts talking. He says, oh, Dad, um, hey, would you be able to help me? And then he stopped, and he said, oh, sorry, you're working. Mm. Couch. I had my Bible open, and he associated that with me uh, working. Yeah. And for him, it was... It was a point of disconnect, and I, without even trying, I had completely disconnected from hmm. my first place of ministry. Your home. My home. Yeah. And, man, and how often do we do that? Um, in service to the pulpit, in service to the ministry, whatever that yeah. means. Well, I, I can't do ministry for the ministry. Right. Yeah. You can't right. see the forest for the yeah, trees, I, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard uh, it time and time again being referred to as sacrificing your family on the altar of ministry. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm too busy to minister because I'm too busy in ministry. And what if, what if your ministry, what if your ministry is working 30 years in the same job to provide a home that is centered on <clears throat> Christ? You know, to what if your ministry is to. Uh, it, it, was that a stomach? <laughs> wow, that was crazy. But what if your what if your uh, did we lapel your belly button? What's going on here? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but but what if your ministry is is to is to work diligently for the glory of Christ, so that your and, and not just to provide 
the right house and the right picket fence and everything, but so that your kids can see you providing or your family can see you providing and investing in kingdom work and doing these things and being, being a faithful steward of what God is giving. What if your ministry is to work those 30 years in the same job to be the witness for Christ. So when your family um, sees you, they they have a model for what ministry looks like, and none of it may have to do with the pulpit or the yeah. Sunday school class or whatever. So um, let's um, let's give some encouraging word as we mm-hmm. as we go. Um, let's just go around the table if you've got something on your heart, just something to encourage people um, as we as we leave them. With a, a nugget of, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, let's cast our nuggets. Nick, you want to start? We'll just go this way. Drop your nugs, Nick. Start over there. <laughs> you want to start this way? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. Um, that's okay. Um, um, <laughs> you bear the image of God. Mm. You're image bearers of God, and God has called you for something phenomenal. Um, it does not mean God has called you necessarily uh, to be a vocational pastor, but God may, it may be calling you to be a vocational human, which is a higher Ooh. calling, a higher calling. So live into that. Live, it, live joyfully into that. Jason, thanks for those words. Live joyfully into that and in the, in the profound joy of Christ. Um, and knowing, knowing that you are enough by yourself, who you are, you're enough. God, God chooses you as you are. You're enough. And so Amen. live into that. Yeah, that's good. Nick, can we go your way now? <laughs> <laughs> what have you got for people? Uh, or what have you learned? How about that? Give us a takeaway. Um, well, it's it's been a process of learning mm. a since this since a uh, no, this is this is a process for me. <laughs> uh, it's a process of, of learning. So it took me a long time to get back into to go back to hauling trash. Um, I felt like it was a step back, but. God has opened up some doors for me in that vocation. Um, there was a guy I was training, and he he grew up, uh, in his words, going to church, and he said, you know, there's Pentecostal, and then there was what we were. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he he's from Brazil, and so I was chatting with him, but he's basically, a, a, he's an agnostic right now. And so... God opened up that door for me to be able to go and speak into his life, into those areas of unbelief, and speak the gospel to him. Um, and I'd love to tell you, oh, he accepted Jesus. He didn't. And that's okay. We still had a conversation. And he is one conversation closer to knowing the God that I know. Wait, well, even in the process of discipleship, one I don't believe one has to be a convert in order to be a learner of Christ. You can Absolutely. still teach christ to the unbeliever right and share those principles and yeah and when you accept them christ accepts them right and so just know that that Mm -hmm. number one you are where you're at for a reason and for a purpose and that purpose is to be the image bearer of christ but also to look at the person across from you and know that they are the image bearer of christ whether they believe that jesus is real or not and there's still potential there right Mm -hmm. right good chris yeah i mean google Wisdom. <laughs> I just how to end a podcast um, <laughs> on a high note. Yeah, there there was nothing. There was nothing. <laughs> absolutely nothing. We need um, to write that blog, don't we? I mean, I I guess I, the only thing that I would add would just be an encouragement to somebody who has not viewed yourself as being in ministry. Would be you have a the potential for you to impact those around you in the environments where you work, live, play, and study is a hundred times greater than any pastor mm-hmm. that is in full-time right. vocational ministry. Mm-hmm. And so don't neglect that. And take, don't let uh, don't let that scare you either. Just look at it and see it for what it is. You have the ability to show the love of Jesus to those around you, and your actions, man, they, they will do so much more than someone hearing a message. Mm-hmm. That's really true. I think that helps us understand that, again, it takes the entire body of Christ. Jeff, you preach some amazing, profound revelatory, wisdom-filled sermons. I mean, it, it's what you do. The Lord has gifted you to do that. You do that, but you do that to a select right. few. That's right. And so the people that are within earshot of you, they get that, but there are billions right. of people beyond the doors of, of where you, you speak, and the same for me and the same for everybody else. 
And so we all need to be activated and aware um, of how the Lord has gifted us and where he's placed us to minister. Um, in the Acts, uh, we're reminded that each man has been appointed by God to a time and a place. Right. We're all here um, because it, in this time we're alive in the city we're alive in, and we live where we live, and we work where we work because God has ordained that. And so where you are now um, is your place of ministry. <coughs> and, you know, I happen to teach a couple Sundays out of week on a, on a Sunday morning, and that just reminded me what Chris said earlier. He's like, I haven't taught in three months. Well, what happened is you have lived under the false pretense that you can only teach when you are at a service, at a That's gathering, yeah. mm. in a pulpit, with a prepared sermon. Um, we've made it this thing that it's not. Again, naturally, and you messaged me the other day, you're like, you know, I have these conversations um, around these people around a campfire in a bar or whatever it is. And what? I have more authentic r- conversation. I'm hitting the bars with, every night, with, dude. Right. With, with, I'm having these in-depth conversations more when I'm out and about or inviting people over than, or you know, hanging out by a fire than when we're actually sitting in a room call, uh, with a group of people for the purpose of a Bible study mm. once a week or yeah. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So the opportunity to have authentic relationships and ministry happen in your life is infinite. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody... Um, that you come into contact with, that's a there's potential ministry that can happen there. And again, get away from this false pretense or um, unrealistic expectation that every conversation is going to end with somebody praying a sinner's prayer, which that whole situation is a thing in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, what is there, you know, I, I look at it this way, again, have I pointed them more to desiring Jesus? Again, it doesn't have to be through the words that I speak, but then my actions, like, are they, it, have I ministered to their need in this time based on, you know, the way the Lord has led me to minister to that need. And so I would just encourage people to stay open and, and, you know, let go of that, that thought process that you need to have a title or a paycheck in order to be in full-time ministry. Again, be a vocational human, see everything in your life, everywhere you go and every person, you know, tap into the heart of the Father, God, and th- and that really helps me, Father. What is your heart for that person mm-hmm. right now? Not what do I think that person needs. I I think one of the problems with labeling people on the streets as homeless is that we think that their the answer to their problem is a home, or a house, or a place of shelter. Right. Those people have so many freaking problems, mm-hmm. but we've labeled them based on what we think the answer to their problem is. Yeah, do and I s- need to plant or water in this situation? Yep, mm-hmm. yep. Um, Jessica says, uh, we need authentic relationships within the church as well. Sometimes that can be a struggle. That's it's the different. hardest place to find community. It's crazy. And honesty, yes. ironically. Um, ironically, it's well, hard to find that honesty. That goes back yeah. to that sin having power. Yeah. The praise Jesus crowd is a lot less honest oftentimes than the screw God crowd. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah. Crazy stuff. Well, we covered a lot. Lots of great insight. Jeff, we're so appreciative of your time. Well, thanks for having I, me. I know you're busy, but really... No, we, I choose. That's my choice. I choose. <laughs> yeah, no, I see it. But I was going to say, I mean, we really do see uh, the, the podcast as a ministry. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it is our heart to, to uh, hopefully help people who are listening to the podcast. And that's... I mean, I love doing it. There's a lot of selfishness in it. But honestly, it, it pays off. It pays nothing. But it pays off when we get... Right. messages um, like, hey, we, I've listened and um, I wasn't a believer or I had fallen away, but the Holy Spirit is, has done something in me and something you said or Casey said or whoever it is, you know, really did something mm-hmm. and words have power. And so we just want to continue to speak life and serve in that regard. And so thank you for thank joining you us me. in this service. And Nick, you certainly served this morning by being here. Um you were on, what, three hours of sleep or something crazy like that? And, yeah, somewhere around And there. you're here, and, and I'm tired, and Chris was sick, but, you know, we, we get out of the way, and um, we come and do this because we see the value behind it. So, And I think we need to say thank you to Chris's stomach issues because they added— <laughs> That wasn't me, actually. They added, I don't know who that was. I don't either, they but added we're going to blame you. All right, texture. that's fine. I'll take <laughs> it. I, I it thought, was me. I thought was someone was responding to what someone said. It was like, mm. <laughs> maybe he was just saying it's time to shut it down so we can go grab lunch yep. yeah awesome well <laughs> our thank thank you to all of our podcast listeners out there uh, certainly go um, follow us on instagram 
Facebook and Twitter. Visit SaltyDogsPodcast.com and you can join our email list. Uh, join our Facebook group. If you haven't yet, search Salty Dogs Christian Podcast group in Facebook and uh, reach out to us. We want to hear from our listeners. Actually, if you go to our Contact Us page, there's multiple ways you can reach out to us. You can shoot us a message there. You can send us an email. And we also have a Google Voice account, and you can send us text messages. And I actually have received some text messages from some people. So that's been pretty great. Uh, Me, Casey, and Chris, we see all those messages and everything, and um, we uh, we share them with each other, and we we do want to help minister. I actually have a phone call scheduled on Monday with somebody who reached out who needed someone to talk to. And so uh, really ministry... Um, being able to happen through this podcast